I don't know why Zoom does it. Anyway, welcome back. There we are with uh, There Will Be Bourbon. And tonight, if you are on the wonderful world of Twitter, you know this man. Uh, well, you should if you don't. His name is Javier Goya on the Twitter sphere. Goes uh, at Javier Goya 7 was where you can find him. And uh, a lot to get into with this man tonight, but he's, he's a very interesting guest. And I think once we actually start uh, get the conversation <laughs> flowing, you'll understand why. Um, before we do that, though, I want to talk about real quick what will fuel this conversation. A little Buffalo Trace kosher. Have you seen this one, Mr. Goy? I've not. I've not seen the kosher. Yeah. No, sir. Yeah. So the but kosher is pretty cool, right? So it's it's certified by the. It's a partnership with the uh, the Chicago Rabinacle Council, right? So everything's kosher. Um, follows all the the kosher rules and and laws or whatever. And then uh, it's it's it comes out every year after Passover. It's a seven-year bourbon, and it's a 94 proof, so a little stronger than the normal Buffalo Trace, but it's delicious. And then at some point, based off of Red's recommendation, I will probably get into the old the double oak from the Woodford Reserve, which is really cool oak. because what people are get capitalizing on these gimmicks in the bourbon market right now is this whole toasted thing. Michter's yeah. does it. Uh, Elijah Craig does it. Uh, there's a few others, but they kind of started it, whereas essentially, you know, they do the normal aging process, and then they take it out toast a barrel with like really heavy char and then they just refinish it and it, it kind of adds a whole level of like campfire marshmallow flavor to it but this one is incredible i'm surprised it took me this long to actually get into it um so before we we actually start so yeah you, he's javier goya seven on twitter uh, i am at eric twbb for there will be bourbon very creative i know acronyms that's how we roll um so before we start again get on the youtube channel like subscribe share with your friends let them know, hey, and on all your podcast sites, Apple, Spotify, whatever, you can find there will be bourbon. And tonight we're going to get into uh, maybe a little tequila right over here, which he knows way more about than I do. <laughs> oh, that could get rough. But anyway, all right. So briefly about you while I bring, while I bring up your bar. So you're born and raised in southeast Wyoming, right? Yes, sir. Graduated high school in Kentucky. And you guys yes, ended sir, up but there after. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you. I'm going to pause yeah, you. Yeah, what do you got? You, uh, you're talking about what fuels you, which is great. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what fuels me. And I did this for the folks at home because I always get asked almost every day. I, th I think every single day on Twitter, somebody DMs me or hits me or says something about making a tequila drink or what's your favorite tequila. And I, know that, uh, I just I know wanted to be real. Well. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And I'll just be <laughs> real brief. So I brought this bottle. This bottle, okay. is, called, this bottle is called Ria Azul. All right. Um, it is it's an Añejo. Um, and... I found this bottle with my neighbor in Houston. He came over one night and he said, what are you drinking? And I said, I'm drinking Don Julio in 1942. And he says, well, yeah. that's a good bottle. He goes, that's a great bottle. Have you ever tried this? You know how it goes. Have yeah. you ever tried this is a, is, is a wonderful icebreaker. <laughs> so this is 1942 dumbed down about half the cost and twice the flavor. It is a fantastic sipping tequila. Um, we would buy um, a case of 24 of them. And after you buy the case, it's about $45 a bottle. And we would split them. And, um, and then we, I would use them for, for friends and whatnot. But uh, it's called Riazul, R-I-A-Z-U-L. It's my favorite sipping um, tequila. And then uh, I like a plethora of others, but, but this is, I'm going to pour one out right now and get one going. Yeah, what, what does that mean? Blue River? Is that what that is? Uh, on the side? Well, no, Ria Azul. So Azul is blue. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ria Azul. Ria, so it's blue. Ria, Ria Azul is blue. Yeah, Blue River. Okay, look at me. I, See, thought you saw the blue. I thought you saw the blue label there on the side of the uh, bottle. I didn't. And all that. No. That's just a 96 tequila rating. Okay. Blue. Oh, I put this. So, and you said Anejo. So, what makes it an Anejo? Anejo. Um, well, it's going to, it's, it's, the Blancos are going to be more filtered out. These are going to have, this Anejo actually has a little bit of additives in it. Just gonna, okay. It's going to be a little bit sugarier. Um, and it's going to be done in a darker, it's going to be done in a dark wood. Yeah. I finish. see the color. So similar cool. to the bourbons. The colorings are dark. So that's so, so pretty cool. All yeah. right. So you know what? And, and while we're at it, this may take place and I apologize for those who listen, which is most of you, and you don't get to actually see the visual aspect of this. So we were just discussing before we started recording. So, you know, up in the dry Diggins distillery in El Dorado Hills, they sell this tequila, uh, Musa, I believe it is. Musa. Musa. Yeah, yeah. Musa. Okay. Um, now the story relayed to me, I don't know how, how true it is, but it sounds really cool. And it's, it's 
pretty amazing. Uh, so every one of these bottles is hand blown glass. You can see all the imperfections, if that's what you want to call them, or perfections, I guess, maybe throughout. Uh, it's all bottled by hand as well. Uh, made 100% as it's told to me by women in this really small village on top of a mountain in uh, Mexico. This one is 52%, so 104 proof, 100% agave salmiana, I guess. All right. I, don't mm -hmm. know that, I don't know if there's a difference in the agaves, but yeah. So I, I may or may not open this, and this is bottle 38 of 73 as handwritten on the back, which is pretty yeah, cool. We we may have to change that poster behind you that there will be tequila. <laughs> there will be tequila. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Um, before I tell that story, let me, let me, let's just get in a little bit about you and, and who sure. you are. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm going through your bio and it, it's just a lot cooler if you would just tell the story, right? So before you do that, but your family originated from Kentucky. You went into the Bluegrass State since it was a state. Your family's been there forever. During the Civil War, your family was split you know, long-term fallout, which I can obviously imagine over certain issues, uh, still hasn't resolved itself, or maybe it has, he says, several yeah, generations. It's, it's, oh, yeah, it's absolutely, it took, okay. several, it took a couple generations, but no, it's all resolved, we're all, we're all kin again, and uh, we good. all talk, and um, uh, no, no, but the, the, this state has been, um, has been in my, my family's been in this state since before it was a state, since it was Virginia. That's crazy. So and, that's um, before bourbon was a bourbon. It was just before bourbon did. was bourbon. <laughs> it was yeah. just what and, you guys did. No, you're that's right. So cool. And uh, and it's funny because everybody asked me if we had bootleggers in my family, and we did not. Really? Um, most of my family is from West Kentucky, not in the mountains. Okay. Most of my family is from West Kentucky. Um, there is there are two towns named after named after my grandmother's side on my dad's side of the family. That's so cool. um, my grandfather was born, and, and this is a great story. Um, and, and this might give me away to some people in Kentucky because he's, he was born in 19 ought fours. He liked to say it. And he, <laughs> he was, he was too young for world war one and too old for world war two. That's crazy. He lived to be a hundred years old. He was in, in 04. That's, he, oh yep. That's he passed man. in 04 and he, he was, he was the greatest influence in my life. Um, Can you think about you that know, though real quick? Like he saw world war two, he saw world war one, but he was too young. Yep. And then he also yeah. sold 9-11 and the invasion into Iraq. Like, think about just, yep. that's, a, that's, a, that's a crazy span of life to, and things to have witnessed from a technology aspect, right? But then also just in the way the world became. Yep. He went to Paducah Dillman High School. And if you're in Kentucky, you know where it is. All you West Kentucky folks know exactly where it is. Um, he played both ways on a cinder, on a cinder, train cinder coal football field with a leather helmet when they wore the helmet. But, um, but he, so, so it, yeah, it was optional, but yeah. you know, a great story about him and, um, uh, and a great honor to my family was he, he, he could not participate in World War II because he was too old. Um, so what he did was he, he led the Kentucky militia and he uh, qualified every boy who went to World War II out of the state of Kentucky on, on the rifle. So when they, they had to qualify, Every boy that went, he qualified them on open sites at 100 yards on iron sites on the rifles. And so, you know, he'd tell the story. He'd said, we just lined them up. He said all day long. He said, we were teaching basic, basic marksmanship, um, basic gun safety, basic cleaning. And he said, that's all he did for, for months and months and months and months. That's, he, he basically didn't work. He, that was his contribution yeah. to World War II. That's um, did and, he do that? And, did he, was he all about the Kentucky windage? That, that oh, was? 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. He, uh, you know, the story, you know, the stories they tell, he, he, he was, a, he was a practical joker. And, um, and, and, and someday when I'm able to reveal my identity, um, which is a different story in its own right. And, and I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm a little remiss because I'd like to honor him a little better, but right. he, he had 75 years of perfect attendance at Rotary. Um, he was a Mason and, uh, he was a Mason and, um, uh, there are videos of him giving stories um, over about a 50 year period of him giving speeches at rotaries around the country. And the stories are incredible because he was a great practical joker and he was a great hunter and he was a great fisherman. And, uh, and, and, and I wish I'd had the gift that he had of, uh, of public speaking. I, I don't, um, but, uh, but he was a great I honor. Just, to I my would disagree. Family. 
I would. Great I, I honor think in my you, yeah, I think you underestimate your your. I mean, I've never seen you publicly speak, but we clearly understand that you have the ability to to use the at least the written word, and you're not doing <laughs> that here. So. Oh uh, well, I appreciate that. But that, yeah. that's, that's where um, I am. I, that's where I came from. So uh, when my father graduated college, um, he he had grown up here. He grew up hunting and fishing in West Kentucky, okay. and uh, he grew up in Frankfort, Kentucky, which is the capital. And uh, but he, hey, when Buffalo he was in Trace. college. I am currently about. 30, 40 minutes from Buffalo Trace Distillery. Jealous. I'm about I'm about 12 minutes from Angel's Envy. Okay. I'm about uh, well, I will see the la- I'll see the lady that runs Heaven Hill tomorrow. Um, that was the first I place did. I ever went to was Heaven Hill. Yeah, yeah. Cool yep. And the family that the family that owns it and and, and runs the brand for them um, is is a good friend of my wife's. And uh, and I and it's funny because everybody's like, oh, you know all the bourbon people. I know them all. I know Tom yeah. Bullet. I've been to the horse races with Tom. Um, he's a great, great guy. And um, um, I just don't, I, I just not a fan. Like I like, like I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a good enough palate to sit here and talk with you about, you, you know, Red sitting here talking about double oaks. I'm good with tequila. And I, here's the reason why. I have, I have a theory behind this. I think after two, I think after two tequilas, you can't taste anything. And, 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 and for me, that's perfect. <laughs> and I don't drink a lot. Everybody's laughing yeah. like, Oh, I, yeah, how, he's, how he's drinking again. I don't drink a lot. I really don't. We're just, we're too busy. We're running, we're, we're, we're managing kids and horses and, and, uh, traveling and, yeah. and, uh, and, and so I don't drink a lot, but when I do, I enjoy tequila. That's, that's really about it. Hey, but, you know, it's all about really what you appreciate and enjoy. That's yep. what I tell everybody. Like so they're, they're, I get a, it. It goes back to your DM questions. I get tons of those about, you know, bourbons and all. It's like, look, it doesn't no. matter what I like. No. And the price point definitely means nothing. It's like, if you, you need to know what you like and stick to it and go tr- and, and just do that. If it's a that's $20, right. if it's something that's 20 bucks, then great. Drink it, drink it all day. You know, Drink it all day. But if, if you are chasing a price point, I would say you'll usually be disappointed because you have a, you have a built-in level of expectation that you probably won't meet. And that's the problem. That's right. Uh, so that's right. And, there, and, there, and there's good stuff out there. I mean, some of the oh, best yeah. tequilas are two or $300 a bottle. And then this right here, I'm telling you, is as good as any of them. And it's, I can, you know, if you're yeah. buying it if you're in Texas, you can probably get it for probably $55, $60 a bottle. And if you buy it in bulk, it's probably $45, $50 a bottle now. Mm-hmm. But but you know, long story. So, uh, long story short. So, uh, my father was dating this girl, and her brother lived in Denver, and uh, he was a hunter. Like my my family's been hunters since since as long back as you can see. And someday I'd love to, I'd love to. And I know there's a lot of, I know everybody. They all joke around about me being a fud. I am. All right. I, there's no doubt. And I, I I earned it honestly. This guy. Um, I know you do. It's all right. I love it. I love no, it. No, I'm the I fud. I, I, no, 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 no. Oh, I'm yeah. The oh, you have I'm no the idea. fud. Compared the to fud. our group? Oh, come Wait on. Wait till man. Louisville Gun and these guys. You know, Louisville Gun's right down the road from me here. Oh, but, yeah. Well, um, that's these another boys, level. I'm not even close. Yeah. They're a whole other level. But, but um, whenever there's, if there's a trap and skeet competition, you boys better hold on to your pants. Oh, and man. you better hold your wallet, put your wallets in your pants. <laughs> that's what I grew up doing was shooting trap and skeet. But, um, but, you know, he took my father elk hunting out, out, out in uh, Wyoming, and that was it. It was over. My, my, life, my, my, my father's life changed. And yeah. he did from that point forward to, when he, to graduate in college was to be out west. And he ended up, the only job he got was north of Cheyenne, Wyoming. And uh, he yeah. moved out there in uh, 1969, and he became an elk guy. And, uh, and, and he started up, and back in the day, you Sounds know. Sounds like and, Braxton. You know, Braxton and I, Braxton and I, we've talked about it. It was very different back yeah, then. You guys um, should definitely partner up on a hunt or something. We've, we, Brax, Braxton has got all of his hunting under well control. If he ever needs me to come and haul stuff for him, I will. Um, I've offered to come help. Um, because awesome. he is, he is, he is a whole different ball of wax. Yeah. Um, but he and my father, if they ever sat down together, which I think someday we're going to get to get, get to have happen, we'll tell stories of just that's all he did was he started up north and he used to be able to guide all the way down right it wasn't like it is today it's very hard it's very hard to hunt very hard to guide very hard to get on leases very hard to get tags but back in 1970 it wasn't and so you you could just hunt all year round and, and so i grew up a kid um um you know we we were on the north platte river fishing for trout and uh when school was out i was doing i was doing one of two things when i grew up if i wasn't working at, at uh, if i wasn't working and, and on horseback falling off chasing cattle um we were skiing or, or we were shooting ducks and geese um, and chasing elk and fishing for trout. 
that's all I, that's all I did. And, um, you know, it didn't make me smart, but it made me sufficient, self-sufficient. Um, it's a different type of end, smart. It is, type, it is, yeah. it is. And it's a whole different, it's a whole different world. And, uh, and right when I was, uh, right, right when I was getting ready to head into high school was when the um, oil markets tanked and inter- Wyoming's an energy state. Um, yeah. And uh, there was no work and, and, and we, you know, he tried forever to, to, to hang on and, and he ended up, we ended up having to come back to Kentucky. Yeah. Um, you know, we, heck, we moved in with my grandparents and uh, we were there for a little bit. And um, it, that was really when my life changed. Um, I was very fortunate because I, I got to spend more time with my grandparents and my father was working and my grandfather yeah. and we did a whole different kind of fishing and hunting and we started shooting doves and we shot ducks here and, and uh, we started chasing whitetails and um, um, but I got to spend time and, and listen to a, a man you know really teach me about about, uh, about about what really being a man was about you know it's not about you know it's not about what you kill or or, or how hard you fight or, or, or being right. Uh, my grandfather's motto was, was, did you help your neighbor? And, uh, that's how he lived his life. And so that's, that's really, I think what began forming my view on, um, on, on the way I wanted my life to shape up. Um, but I got to spend time in Kentucky. I ended up graduating high school from here. I started college here. I'm a college dropout. I made it through the, uh, made it, I started my junior year and I walked in and I sat there and I, and I was like, I'm like a C minus student. I'm barely hanging on. And, um, I was like, this is stupid. Like I'm wasting money. And, and so and, and, before, before you go on, though, did you, w- when you were in college and you felt like you were wasting money, did you feel like you went to college because you had to? Absolutely. So, yeah, you know, and, I, and come, something I, I come from a, a crazy family. Today, yeah. I talk to people a lot, especially the, the kids today. Like it, it was totally different. Cause I don't think we're, I was a class of 99 in high school. What, were you around that? 93. Okay. So yeah. So, you know, I mean, it was kind of, expected of you to go to college right whether you want to be there or not it was kind of expected just as a generation it doesn't have to be specifically your family but i think we were pushed to that whereas today it's even worse it's way worse today yeah and i've got i've got two kids who just got out of college that's right and um and uh you know and i I, i'll be honest so eric i don't like talking about myself I, i really don't but but i do think that my story adds a little something to people and i do think people would appreciate sort of what i went through so um uh at 15 years old um so my oldest brother is eight years older than me and my next oldest brother is four years older than me okay my brother younger than me is 15 months younger than me and and then one year to the day below him is is my fourth brother so there's five of us five we're all very, we're all, we're all very different <laughs> um we really truly are but there's one thing that, that took place in all of our lives and not mine and uh, I wrote you about it on my bio. Yeah, yeah, you did. And, uh, and I was going to talk about it real quick. So yeah, go ahead. we moved. We moved to Kentucky. Um, my oldest brother, who's eight years older than me, is is in is at West Point. Um, mm-hmm. He received his nomination in Wyoming from Cheney, um, and so he's he's there. My next brother, as we move there, and he's four years older than me. I'm starting as I'm starting high school. He's he goes to the Naval Academy. Yeah. So my oldest brother was a was a senior at West Point, and my next oldest brother was a plebe at. Um, at Navy. And, um, so they were there opposite of each other at the same time, which made for fireworks and a very interesting (laughs) first army Navy game. Um, and so they went through, um, my old, my oldest brother, uh, got out, went Ranger qualified, ended up working. He actually ended up getting the call and, and, um, uh, he actually worked for Cheney when he was secretary of defense, uh, on his personal staff. And then he went military intelligence. And then my next brother, he was at Navy, and he's actually famous. And someday, when I'm not, when I can't, when I can re- remove my yeah. identity, okay, I'm gonna look this up. He he has <laughs> he has the most demerits ever given a student who was not kicked out. <laughs> ah, His awesome. entire junior year, he wore a black uniform. And what um, does that and it, signify? It, he couldn't leave for 12 months. He wasn't allowed to leave for Christmas. He was He had a choice. <laughs> so I'll tell you. So it's a great story, right? And it's gonna. And I'm and excuse me while I. Uh, no hey that's what we do right uh, here. You know, uh, you're up, i will i will do the same you know, sir he um he, you know he he's a he's, a, he's just a, he's a different card he's like my grandfather he's a practical joker and he he got together some fellows and they were on their summer cruise and uh they I guess they were coming back into the harbor and the next thing you know there was a there was a turnabout there was another ship passing them and um they th- there was made possibly a mooning involved and the other ship ended up having admiral on it and it's Allegedly. It, it, <laughs> allegedly no it was true and it happened and he admitted it and he said i'm the ringleader it was my deal and they said well you can leave 
um, because they're very upset about this. You can leave or you can serve your penance. He said, what's my penance? And they said, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I made my, that was a long time ago. So maybe I made yeah. it 88, whatever the demerit was or whatever they call it. The number they told him had never been given before. 80, 100, <laughs> pick a number. Academy guys on that, whatever the number was. And he said, oh, okay. And they said, what else? He said, you can't, you're, you're restricted to base to the school for 12 months and you got to wear a black uniform. He said, oh, that's it? Yep. Yeah. Because they probably wanted him to it. leave. They weren't expecting him to stay. That's awesome. No, they didn't. And he stayed yeah. and he toughed it out. And he ended up, he ended up uh, flying helicopters. Um, oh, and then, damn. and then, and so, so while all this is going on and I'm watching my brothers, they're just living this great life. And, and my fully intended to go to West Point. And uh, my mom and dad ended up getting divorced when I was 16 years old. And it was very, very nasty. And it really changed my life. Um, I ended up living with my grandparents for a little bit. Um, uh, it, it turned my worldview upside down. And I went from this whole sort of nuclear family yep. situation into a very traumatic situation. It was not good. Um, and everybody's got their own stories, right? And, 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 and I, I think I handled it as well as I could. But um, when it came time for me to make my decision, I was in no shape to go to West Point. Um, and I was really in no shape to go to school, but I had to. There was, there was no, there was yeah. no, you're not going to school. Um, I was out in Wyoming working ranches. Um, I'd left and uh, I decided to go to school. And uh, the only place that I could afford because nobody was paying for my school and I, and I wouldn't take out loans. So I was working in the summer, saving up money. Um, um, and I got a scholarship to the University of Kentucky. Um, so I was oh, there cool. for a little oh, wow. bit. I was at the University of Kentucky for a little bit because I'd been here and I'd done well in high school. And yeah. so I got an in-state type scholarship. So I was there and uh, I just hated it. I, 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 yeah. I didn't, you know, I, I love political science. I love math. Right. So I did OK. But I I just felt this need to be self-sufficient just out from everybody, everybody's wings. So I worked. I worked two jobs. I just worked all the time. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I felt ashamed that I didn't go to the military. Um, I, I mean, I, I, it really bothered me. Yeah. Um, and, um, but you know, the, the crazy thing is, and, and, and I think life, you know, I'm, I'm a very faithful guy and, uh, I came very roundabout from faith and, um, I was not faithful back then under any circumstances. Um, I was a lost ball in tall weeds. Um, <laughs> but I ended up in a bar on a random night and I told this on Braxton field, but here it um, comes, here comes the bio part I'll where I wanted him to tell the bio it. part. Tell, the yeah, bio here part, it is. Right? This is great. So all this is, great all this is going all, I mean, two things happen in the same week. Okay. So my younger brother, uh, in, in the same week, he enlisted in the Navy. Yep. Actually listed in the Marine Corps. Um, and he went to Chicago and yeah. five yeah. days later, I'm in playing pool in a bar in Kentucky and the guys behind me lost the guy and they said, um hey does anybody want to play a game pool and i was at a table of five or six people like i'll play How i ended up playing with these guys that? a random and i play all night and were they uh, older like I mean, did they, were they oh just yeah, yeah. Of... i mean uh late 20s early 30s i mean just uh, based on what you're going to say next where they did they look like they drug dealers is what i thought they were okay got it <laughs> money fly, i mean money yeah. that's what I, that's shoes, why i'm asking because it's just slip it's, pants. It's random. You know, uh, Jack's ghost type watches. I'm sitting here going, <laughs> Shout out to Jack's what ghost, what buddy. <laughs> are these guys doing in you know, a bar I'm, in Kentucky, right? Just in a bar, random bar, yeah, and, random uh, bar in Kentucky. I mean, I woke up the next morning on my couch and I'm like, Oh my gosh, what just happened to me? And my pocket was a business card and said, You start Monday morning at seven o'clock, took the job right there. I had no idea what they did, <laughs> no clue what it was. And uh, were you worried? No, I, yeah. I mean, uh, a little bit, a little bit, um, a little bit. Yeah. But, uh, I walked in, I sat down and 30 minutes of being there, I picked up a phone and, uh, I said, I said, I, I found my calling and, um, and that was it. I've never stopped I've been in the commodity markets ever since. And, uh, All right. So stop there. So you're it. in the commodities, right? So for yeah. everybody who's not in your world, what the hell does that mean? Well, um, I, I, I broker trade and manage risk for um, very large commercial and government uh, type entities um, throughout the globe in some different commodities. And uh, I'm going to keep my, my specific commodities to myself because I have to. Okay, um, that's fine. That, so what's, what's I, a commodity for those wondering? Well, um, what falls under that umbrella? Anything that can be um, um, in general, in, com in a commercial sense, 
a commodity is going to be any type of a good or service. So some okay. service are, can be commoditized um, that can be eaten, burned, stored, um, used at a later date. And I could give you hundreds of them. So you like, uh, you know, um, uh, gosh, well, beef, it? right. That works. Well, well there's cattle, there's uh, yeah. nat- there's gasoline, there's heating oil, there's uh with bourbon is a commodity absolutely absolutely you can invest there's in this shit now same with tequila i can, get the fucking ads get in, every day invest you in can everything. get shares you can invest yeah. in anything now there's a difference in investing and trading right in investments where you're going to go and you look for a return on a business ah. trading is where you're trading you know the ultimate sense of the word of trading is moving a commodity from one place to another economically okay. right so a, no the old trader basically says okay um i'm going to be sitting at my desk and i've got a cache of clients all around the world and it might be, um, I'm going to pick a business. So let's just pick one that everybody knows. Let's pick gasoline. Let's pick uh, gasoline. Yeah. Um, I'm tired so of the prices. Say, What's up? Pi- I'm a pi- I'm pilot, right? I'm, pi- I'm pilot gas stations. Uh, yeah. My boy, my, my big boy trucker boy, he's out there running around in pilots all the time. And I always, tell, I always hit him up when I'm on the road. Um, give me the best uh, pilot station to pull into. He always hits me up, tells me the best, the best crappers on the planet. Uh, <laughs> But it's a great um, spot. they've got these gas stations, right? And, and, and gasoline gets refined in different refineries. Some of it's, we bring gasoline into the country. Yeah. Uh, we refine some of it here. Um, but I'm sitting at my desk and pilots like, well, I need to get X amount of barrels moved to a certain region of the country called Nashville, right? So I need to get Nashville, Knoxville um, because I'm short and the guys on their desk are like, I need to find it or whatever. So they'll call me or they'll call a competitor of mine and they'll be like, hey, we're looking for gasoline to come in here, right? So I'm going around wherever I can. I'm going to ports, I'm going to different regions, and I'm finding somebody who's got excess product. And then I'm going to match up logistics and I'm going to find rail cars or I'm going to find trucks. Or if it's overseas, I'm going to book a, a, a cargo ship or a barge or whatever. Any different types of logistics. And the hope is that I buy it at a price and I sell it to pilot at a price where there's some type of an ARB involved. And the risk involved in that is going to be time. Um, the risk involved in that is going to be logistics, right? So if I'm late, I'm going to have to pay day charges. Yeah. So my goal is to get from, get a commodity from A to B here safely on time. And that I bought it here at a price, sold it here at a price, covered my cost in the middle and I made a margin on it. Right. And so the idea of a market market efficiency around the globe, and that happens I mean, every single thing that you buy has that component behind it right you should, we, you should be talking to maddie this is her fucking language i'm just like oh. yeah well i mean it's, 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 it's a crazy language right i i just wrecked it it. i just a day one i sat down and you and fell into that because I you decided fell to into like, it. cool that's hilarious to me that's crazy i fell into it and uh and i just love it and uh and i've been doing it's all i do all day long except people who sit me see me post on twitter during the day and they're like gosh what did you do yeah. Well, I got you up on a, I got everybody up on the screen. So what I was your first, what, what was the first week like though? What was, give me your first week. Like were my you successful. Yeah. Like, were you just like, what am I doing? Oh, wow. This is so, amazing. I'll, or, this is a great, this is a great story. <laughs> I, nobody knows who I am. And it's like seven o'clock in the morning on a Monday morning. And I walk into a room and it looks like a uh, Wolf of Wall Street, long desk, <laughs> phones, people yelling at each other. It's kind of quiet and they're sitting there and uh, the guy, everybody I was playing pool, they aren't there yet. Yeah. Okay. They, yeah, so you think, have no idea where anyone is. You're just there, yeah. and they have no idea who you are. No. Some Why guy is goes. This guy hired. Some guy goes. Who are you? <laughs> yeah. And I put this card out, and it says you're hired. And they go, Oh well, sit right here. They found another one. They found another sucker. <laughs> they, would they get you in a bar? Yeah. Oh, yeah. go figure. All right. So sit down right here. Well, I mean, I'm gonna tell you, there's probably ten or fifteen people sitting on the desk, and the, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like all right, well, what's going on? They're all talking on phones and they've got the computers and flashing lights and things are going on. I have no idea what they're saying. They're talking about bids and offers and it was electricity and uh, phone rings and it's right in front of me. And the guy says, pick it up. And I picked the phone up. He said, I just held to my ear. The guy goes, where do you have next day? Where do you have next day? Sin hub? They go, what does he want? So he wants to know where next day Sin hub is. And they said, tell him 25 at 25 and a half. I said, 25 at 25 and a half. He goes, buy it. I said, buy it. They go, okay, how much? 25 megs. I go, 25 megs. He goes, 25 megs. All right, buy a click, hang the phone up. And they're all sitting there and they go, the guy goes, the guy goes, who are you? And I said, I'm sorry. I said, I'm Javier Goy. And he's like, uh, what are you doing? And I said, oh, that. And I was like, I don't know what I just did. And they go, who were you talking to? And I was like, I don't know. 
They're like, oh my gosh, you don't even know who it was. I'm like, nope. And they're like, all right, you're hired. <laughs> uh, we had to figure out who it was, but that was my first day. I was there 30 minutes. I've never stopped. I've been on the phone ever since. And what um, the I've fuck? Different That's markets, crazy. and I've been on. It's taken me all around the world, and I've met great people. And uh, and I'm and it's so funny because everybody's like, oh, where'd you go to school? Like, yeah, didn't really go to school. Uh, what'd you study? Yeah, I, I went. I mean. Studying. Didn't really study. So, so you know, what do you think though? But so that's, that comes all the way back to where we're talking about where people, especially in our generation, were kind of led to believe like you have to go to school now more than ever. People think they have to. And I just, it's hard to get them to think otherwise, but for someone that does what you do, let's be real honest. Like I've got a master's degree. I mean, you didn't finish school. You could clearly earn that if that's something you decided to pursue, but do you need any of that stuff to be successful in your world and what you do? Well, uh, you know, I have to because there's education I, I and there's carefully. the ability to learn, right? And you were able to learn what you do on the job. So I want to tread carefully. I want to tread carefully here um, because a lot of times, a lot of times, I say these things and, and people take me out of context. Um, they take me out of context on Twitter sometimes, and good people that I know that I really like really have like this week. I had a tough week this week uh, with a guy that I really, really like that I, I yeah. think uh, um, that I really like. Um, and I want to, this education thing is very, very deeply important to me. Um, I've had two kids go through college. Um, yep. um, Goya one, uh, graduated <laughs> last year from the, from the university of Wyoming with an astrophysics degree. Oh, wow. Um, and Goya That's two is going to graduate with a business degree from the university of Kentucky in December. She's working on, she just has one COVID class, right? So she's, <laughs> she's graduated. She's doing it online. She didn't go, she just takes it online on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Yeah. She's done. She's essentially, she's graduated. She's working. They're both out of the house, off the paycheck. And, um, and, and, but I've watched them go through school and they both had pretty different experiences. Um, my oldest son was there on a full academic scholarship. He turned out a bunch of division one scholarships for sport to do this because he wanted to snowboard and he got sponsored. He now rides professionally at snowboarding. Um, and he's an um, astrophysics just, major. Yeah. Yeah. He's f- a great, he, he, dude, he's, he, he's not normal. He's not a normal person. <laughs> hey, send that kid not out to fucking uh, send him out to Tahoe so he can uh, hang out and drink oh. hot toddies outside while he snowboards. He'll be there. He will be there. He will oh, be in Tahoe hey, this winter. Well, he'll be on the downhill circuit uh, all winter. He's snowboarding all, all winter. If you're going to visit this winter, please let me know. I'm going to send him your way. I'll get you hooked up with him. But, um, you know, I, I watched what both of them went through, and I know what I went through, and then I know, these, I know the kids we hired. We hire a lot of people, and I uh, read a lot of resumes. And, and I don't, I, I don't, I want to, I want to preface this. And, and I know even under the guise of a skilled education, when I say that, I'm going to say um, a medical degree, engineer. Yeah. As he freezes, unfortunately, it's like they're listening in and trying to not let him speak. Mr. Goya, your signal has temporarily broken up we got to do it hey i i need you to repeat everything you just said because your signal's breaking up mr goya we have lost mr goya well we're going to try and effort him back um i'm going to reach out via the one is is that mr goya thought i heard something i'm going to text this young man there he is are you back i'm here with the- he's back kind of so my connection's good i can see that with the video lag is not there while Mr. Goya attempts to reconnect, we're going to see what we can, we can pull off here. All right. You're there. Your video is there, but you're, you're, you're kind of coming in a little bit, a little bit broken. I'll tell you what. Um, try cutting off your video and let's see if we can just do you on audio. See if that works. It has not worked yet. However, we will effort this. We will, we will figure this out.
How are you? Do um, you, you hear me okay? Do you hear me? I'm good. How are you? All right. I don't know what we just had. I feel we were just uh, technically uh, or temporarily invaded by the people who didn't want us to hear what you had to say. So what you were saying was before everything cut out that you want to be very careful with people who come to you off of like an education background or something. I think think that there is a requirement in in many things where you want to have a skill set. So medicine, um, engineering, like I, I don't want some guy that I don't want some guy building a bridge you know, that said, Hey, I got this off YouTube. It's very, <laughs> it's very true. And I have All a buddy, right, so, who's a, he's a structural engineer or whatever the hell it is. Officially he builds bridges. He's down there in Orlando right now, winning awards. What's up, Chris? Um, but yeah, so I get it. I, think, I have no I idea what that I, dude does, but I think they need, I think <laughs> these guys, I think they need to go to, I think they need to learn. Um, I think our, our higher education system is so broken though. Um, from a sense that it is a giant suck. And the return on the investment at, I believe, almost every level is, it, it's so negative. It, it's such a long, it's such a, you asked a question to me, in my profession, is it possible to be successful without schooling? Yeah. In my profession, it's less schooling and more personality and willingness right. to do certain things. Like there's a certain skill set. When we hire people, we give them a, we give them a, um, a, like a, a, a psychological like testing thing yeah. and we're looking yeah. for a very specific type of person but i think in skilled i think in a skilled sense um we don't you think a certain think, type of person wants to go do what you do though there are certain people that yeah. do most people that come to do what i do they just they just they just fall apart i mean it's just yeah i would so imagine like, and someone who's day. naive and has no idea they just want a job oh. like they're probably not going to be the type of person you want or they're probably not the person that could be successful in that no, they're, they're not. And so it's, you know, we're pretty good at finding who's going to be successful at what we do, it's, you know, but that's not the point because I think that I, I, there's so few people that do what I do on the planet. Yeah. It, it's a really, really small number. I mean, I, you know, me specifically, that, I mean, I probably know them all it's probably less than 500. That's crazy. Um, that's on the that, planet. Is a, that is I mean, insane. It is. And, um, and, and it's been, it's been fun. And I mean, but here's a problem this ever goes away if electronics ever takes over i'm done i mean i i mean i'm i'm bunking in braxton's barn and, <laughs> and, and that's my next that's so my skill set i'm going from here up here you know to yeah here. So it's a lateral transfer for me yeah I'm good, but but one is me sitting here pretending i know what i'm talking about in the finance market and the other one is me pretending i know what i'm talking about with horses <laughs> you know it's kind of the same thing braxton won't know don't tell him I'll He's not, he so doesn't watch it. this anyway it's fine so we're good that's, um, uh, well I, I, that's not true by the way but um <laughs> but no, so, I know. so with higher education i i feel this I, I feel i feel parents pushing their kids you know I'm, i've done this once and i'm going to do it again because my next kids are 13 and 14 i'm going to do it very differently from wow what I did. so mine's 15 so we're like yeah. in the same ballpark so i'm curious what your your next thought is one, I think the institution, if your kid needs to go to school, is more important today than it's ever been. Um, there's not an amount of money. There's not a promise of a job. There's not a promise of a future. There's, not, there's, there's nothing that yeah. could convince me to send one of my kids to an Ivy League school, to many of the pub- – there's some public institutions – um, and I'm going to offend everybody, and I don't really give a shit. Do I, mean, it. I, I don't cuss, but I just did because I'm you so did. mad about I like this. That. I did. I don't curse, and and I apologize. It's fine. Actually, no, no worries. That's like number fourteen this year. I went. I was wanted to go the whole year without cursing, and that's number like I have it written down actually here. <laughs> um, so I, I'm gonna have to write You're it close. down. Close. It's almost December. You're almost there. But like the University of Texas, uh-huh. all you Texans out there, y'all are gonna y'all. I'm gonna be getting this. All, uh, Texas, absolute embarrassment. Blue uh, in 2024. Colorado. I'm saying it. Yeah. I've been saying it. I I believe it's going, and the University of Texas is leading the way. Uh, they're oh, yeah. marching right down the corridor, um, awesome. and it's just embarrassing. Uh, University of Colorado, embarrassment. University of California, embarrassment. These places well, are one. embarrassment. Pick <laughs> all of them. Pick all. Pick the whole California. Well, I mean, system. pick one in California. I mean, yeah, every day I drive system. by, I, I drive by. Every time I drive through Berkeley, either on the way to San Francisco or Oakland to the airport or to the Giants game, I just drive through a freaking homeless encampment. That's all that's under the underpasses in Berkeley. Like it's, yeah, I know it's as far as you can see, it looks literally like a refugee camp. 
you know, that's a whole different story too, but these it institutions is. are littered. Yeah, they're littered and, and everybody's like, oh, they're commies and they're commies. I want to throw them out of a helicopter and build this stuff. And, you know, they're not yeah. commies. No, they're not. No, commies. Absolutely. You know not. what they are? Right. You know, you know, you know what they are? They are, they are, they are money, government employed, sucking individuals who have never done anything in their entire life. They've never created a job. They've never created value out of thin air. And, and they, they receive a position that allows them to, um, it, I, it, it basically, it puts them in a position where they have some sort of an influence over someone else yep. that they would never get anywhere else. Because right. in any part of normal life, they are, their opinion is not valued. They're mm-hmm. expert. They have no expertise. <laughs> nope. But in the college university setting, they have the entire authority and they've taken it and run with it. And they've, they, and, and everybody, and I really get annoyed with the, with the conservative views, the cliched views of commie, um, indoctrination, mm. um, all, all, all of these views, right? Because it doesn't, it blankets, it puts a blanket. Yeah, there's no it. nuance. No, no. And, and university systems are in their own thing. I think K through 12, I think it's a whole different ball of wax. I think the university system, it's a free floater because the kids yeah. are out of your house. Your parents have no say. I mean, it, at least in public schools, I can go to a board meeting and I can rail right. people, whether it's effective or not. I still have to stay over my kid, but at 18, they are, it's a free for all and they, yeah. they are relentless. And so I think that if you are a 15, 18, 17, a junior, if you're in, if you've got a kid in sixth grade, you got to start thinking about what's important to my kid. You know, why would I, as an parent, because a lot of parents aren't going to be like me. I've put very, right. I've put very little money in my kid's college education. I put very little, I, my kids, there's no free lunch. Every kid that everything that every kid in my house does, they are invested in it. They're invested in it with either time. They're invested in it with their money. They're invested like, you know, scholarships for school, both my kids. I, I mean, I, I can give you, I can give you the exact number tomorrow, but the number that I've paid for two kids to go to college out of my own pocket is astonishingly low. And at the same point in time, you know, I'm looking at what they're going to get out of it. And you know, it's not a lot. I, I do think that college is good for, I think that college is good for one thing. I think it's good for organization. And I think it's good for these kids to take a springboard into life, but I don't think it's necessary. I think that right. if we as parents are involved in our kids' lives through a high school, which most kids and parents aren't, most parents are just like, oh my gosh, this is nuts. I went out. They kind of have to go figure it out on their own. And I think college is a place where it's done. And, and you know, I, I, I put this out on Twitter six or seven months ago, and uh, it's still actually it's strange because it comes back up every now and then. And uh, I had said that I had spent my Friday night teaching my playing gin and poker with my 12 and 13 year old at the time. And, uh, and my comment was, if you don't teach your kids how to gamble, if you don't teach your kids how to play blackjack poker, somebody else is, and they ain't going to be very favorable to them. And so <laughs> if you true. don't give your, you know, you, I, <laughs> yeah. I don't want one of my kids to find out the hard way. What, no, I love gambling. Saturday yeah. morning, going to the bank. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what you're describing is, uh, so I was talking about this during the whole, fiasco in afghanistan recently with the evacuation is like all the people in uh you know what whatever at this point all the people that are at that state department or in that level of sphere of influence they're under what i would just i would describe and label as what you just talked about it's the western shield of academia it only works and exists in their very specific realm None of that stuff transpires or none of that stuff transfers to the rest of the world. It's definitely not in the world where they're operating in. Do you think the Taliban or any of those people who are fighting for control in that country give one fuck about what is taught in an Ivy League campus when it comes to political science or international relations or any of these things? Just things that I wasted. And I don't want to say I wasted, but I, I enjoyed learning about them. But things that I, I spent so much time getting a degree field in. Um, but that's what I'm saying. Like we're sitting here pretending to be you know, shocked or outraged off of what the Taliban's done over the last month. And my only question is to those people who are really hot, like occupying those higher up powers or those, those offices of influence is like, what did you really think was going to happen? Do you really think they were going to think like you? Did you really think that? You're asking a question that is, uh, it's really hard to nuance on Twitter. 
Right. And yeah, really you got two hundred. What is okay. it? Two hundred eighty characters now. You can't. Two hundred eighty characters. And, and by and by and by the way, Twitter's great for me. I, I don't have any other social media. Never had. Never <laughs> had Facebook. Never had anything else. Yeah. Um. And Twitter's great for me in the sense that it, it that I'm only able to think in about that many characters. If I, you know, lot, you know, you know, one of one of the guys that I need to sit down and drink with someday is going to be Lee. And I, oh, wanna, yeah. I just want, Love I just want him to, it, but, but here, here's what I want. I just want to sit there and let him read to me. I just, I just want to let him read. Man, I, I had a great listen. podcast with him. I had to remove. I know you did. Yeah. But God, that was so good. Like that. Yeah. Cause I've been meaning to get him back on. It's been over a year. Like our world a yeah. year ago, bro, was so yeah, different. Very different. But, but I want to tell you, so here's my, here's my take on this. <clears throat> and, and I don't talk a lot about it, but I've spent, uh, I've, I've spent a lot of my time, um, over the last 25 years involved in some way, shape or form in the political spectrum. Right. Um, Mitch, I've known Mitch McConnell since I was a kid. Oh, um, yeah. I've known Cheney since I was a kid. I knew Liz Cheney as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, I've known them all. And, uh, in one way, shape, form or another, I've been, um, influenced or I've been involved in business deals that involve the government or different governments around the world. Yeah. And I can tell you that without a fault, that whenever you get a bureaucrat or a person that is in a position in the U S government, or even, you know, in, in British government or Australian government, heck Chinese government, when you start talking to these guys, you realize very quickly that they are not in the position that I'm in. If I make an error in my job, all right, if I make a mistake, there's either a mon- monetary penalty, there's a criminal pen- penalty. You know, if I do it, if you know, I've got a, I, my last day on Twitter will be the day that I describe the choice that I made to be an American or to go to the dark side. And right. I say the dark side, I mean, I've seen it my whole career. I've been in, I've, I've been around it, you know. Uh, I, I started off in Enron and I've seen all of these different corrupt Holy things. Holy shit, you from- started in Enron? No, no, no. I wasn't at Enron. I was involved in it. I was involved in, I was involved in it on the periphery. Uh, It was the first deposition I ever had to give. Oh my goodness. So I had to give a talk about, (laughs) no, we ain't ain't talking about that. (laughs) That's 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 under, that's, that's, uh, 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 -uh. but I, I, you know, I, I, that was the first deposition I ever gave was was because of Enron. Um, But, but it's all, it all boils down to corruption. So when you talk about Afghanistan, you talk about the Taliban, you talk about the government's position on it. Everybody wants to polarize it into some sense of, well, Today, it's Monday. This happened. This is why. And what I, what I think, and by the way, m- there's a lot of people who may, may or may not know her, but um, uh, Shouse, Heather, Heather Shouse, um, yeah, yeah. You know, when, when, yeah. when she talks, when Heather talks about um, whether or not um, you know, you're being monitored or the, or the federal government is involved in a trade or whatever, she's, you know, she always likes to say that that that, that sort of thing is overblown by the public. Well, it absolutely is because when you're dealing with any type of a government in any type of a situation, you're dealing with bureaucrats. You're not dealing with, you're not dealing with people who are one, they're not looking to be heroes. They're looking to literally keep their head down and never make a mistake. But if there's this sort of oil tanker view of the government, right? As long as everybody's kind of pointed in the general direction as a bureaucrat, they're good. They do as little as possible. They never want their head to be above water. They never want their head to be below and water. They don't make decisions. No, no. There's a very and you and you. You know the military guys. I mean, how many yeah. how many guys in the military are actually out there in the action, and how many yeah. are behind it, and they're just hoping that they don't have to go, and mm-hmm. they just you just don't want to get seen, right? Yeah. Well, that's the exact same thing that goes on, in and I think in these political decisions. Afghanistan, I have my own view on it. I've, 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 vo- I've vocally, you know, made the, I made vocal um, uh, views about Afghanistan publicly. Um, I think the entire thing was orchestrated. I think the entire pullout was orchestrated by China. I think that the bureaucrats involved don't care. I think that the senior military leadership in this country is a product of higher education. I think, um, um, I, you know, um, uh, several people always give me grief when I talk about this, but I'm really embarrassed by it. Um, and he's a, he's a perfect example. Okay. I, I hammer Crenshaw every, every week I hit Crenshaw with something because he's a perfect example of this. And Wesley Hunt, I got suckered into, I didn't get suckered. I don't get suckered into things. Sometimes I'm, I, I think I'm hopefully naive. 
sometimes mm-hmm. I want people to be better than they are. Yeah. And I, 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 I worked, I, I didn't work, I didn't volunteer for him, but I pushed Wesley Hunt um, really hard in that last race in, in, um, um, in, in Texas uh, when he ran against Lizzie Fletcher. And um, I raised money for him. And the Wednesday night before the election, my, my buddy and I, we had a huge dinner for him, private deal. He shows up and I'm pushing him, pushing him, pushing him. And then as he, and he gets up to talk and then I'd met him a couple of times. But he's talking, he's talking, and I realized, oh my gosh, this guy went to West Point, flew helicopters, loved his service. He gets he gets the early out, and he ends up getting three Ivy League degrees. Hasn't really worked. Three, since. three. That's what he spent his time doing, what? and he starts pon- he starts trying to pontificate to me about life, <laughs> and we're standing there. And there's a picture and I'm shaking his hand and they're taking a picture of us and I'm whispering him. I said, by the way, I'm out. I ain't supporting you. And tomorrow I'm telling everybody I'm out. And I walked out of the room, out of the dinner what? and uh, yeah, I couldn't stand it. And uh, they called me um, about 45 days ago, 30 days ago. He kind of blindly announced that he was going to run again. And his people called me and asked me for support. I said, lose my number. I'm out. <laughs> and here's the thing. Here's the thing. When you get into this sort of, non-action level sort of this uh this i'm in congress or i'm a senator and you get into this there's these guardrails that they put up for you yeah. and they, as long as you're traveling down the road at the rate congress is going and as long as you don't really get outside the guardrails you're set mm-hmm. as long as you play by their rules you're set and i'm very public about joe kent because oh yes yeah, very yes. public because because the last thing the last he said something six or eight months ago and it was about the last thing he wanted to do was be in Congress. Didn't want to be there. He felt he needed to be there. Yep. Wesley Hunt and Dan Crenshaw want to be there. They yeah. don't want to be anywhere else. I don't want to, if you want to be in Congress and you want to be a part of that, I don't no want any problem. part of you. Yeah, there's a problem. I don't want any part of you. There's I want you to be gone. There's yep. a huge problem. And that's a, that's a big problem. And, I, and one, I don't think people, you know, these guys will take phone calls. I'm just a simpleton, right? I'm yeah. a college dropout simpleton, but I talk to them all the time. And and, and, and I got to tell you, when you're talking about Afghanistan, you're talking about the people in leadership where you're talking about people like Crenshaw and, and, and he, you know, he, he tweets hard, um, you know, but I didn't see him on a plane over there like the guy from Oklahoma. You know, I didn't see him like uh, Nick over there trying to get people out. I see him tweet hard about it. You know, I don't want a congressman who tweets hard. I want a congressman who's ready to get on a plane and go. You know, I, I want people that are, that, are, that, are, that are filled with enough piss and vinegar that they're willing <laughs> To, to do what I'm willing to do, man. I'm not, I'm probably wasn't not that supposed to be, to be what it was. Like, wasn't that, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to figure out the word. Wasn't it like a representative? Isn't that what representative mm-hmm. means? Right. Like you're supposed to represent your district and we don't, we represent the, the capital letter next to our name. We yeah. don't actually represent that district anymore. And that's no, we don't No, And, and then that kind of ties into, I think what you're, I mean, <clears throat> well, without you saying it, what all it ties right, into it's term limits, right? Well, we're never going to get them. Oh, uh, so, well, term limits. Don't you, we're never getting those. I mean, there's a lot of them. things you can talk about. We got about them for the happen. president when FDR kept getting nah. reelected, but we can't nah. get them for anybody else, right? No, nah, no, nah, nah, because they got to vote on. But but let's talk about Afghanistan, right? So yep. you have this, you have these people who for 20 years are all getting paid, right? So um, I, I don't know how many how many congressmen or senators, every you know, the average person who follows you or on Twitter follows me, understand what their life looks like, right? And DC is this mistress. And I think, and you know, God love her. Pop Tart understands this, you know, that's yeah. why I'm friends with her. You know, she understands, she understands what I'm talking about. And, and I don't think a lot of people do that, that you elect somebody and you send them to Congress and you put them in there. And um, it, it's, and I, I call DC a mistress. She, she is the United States biggest mistress. It's not Las Vegas. It's not New York. It's not Chicago. It is DC and it's power. Pop Tart reborn on Twitter. If you need to know who yeah. we're talking about, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah. She, I mean, she's deeply involved in the GOP. I'm not a Republican. I'm not yeah. a Democrat. I can't stand libertarians. I'm my own person. I don't need yeah. to. I, I, I just. I'm with you I at this like point, man. Conservative. <laughs> I've, there's a tweet that keeps haunting me, and it said that there's no political party that can handle my type. It can't handle me because I, I just want accountability, and I want somebody. You know, there, there are liberals out there that, 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 that have talked straight and said, hey, this is what I'm about, and this is what I'm going to do. You know, at this point, I, everyone's fair game for me. Mm-hmm. Most of them prove themselves wrong immediately, yeah, but still, I would say anybody, but you yeah. know, so we're talking about Afghanistan, right? So you got this whole 
bureaucrat, um, you know, this whole, you know, and, and you guys have talked ad nauseum about it, you know, all, oh, yeah. e- everybody from, you know, Grunt Paw and, uh, and Braxton and Red and Frank and um, everybody's talked about it. I don't need to talk about it. I don't want to add my lips to it. All I want to add my lips to it is the mentality that allows that class of person to be in a leadership position in this country has to change. Um, how we go about that, I, you know, the only reason I even am vocal about it, period, is, is I do, the only idea, the only thing I think can happen is that we have to change how we operate amongst ourselves. It starts locally, it starts, it starts with my neighbors, it starts mm, with my family, yeah. it starts with my kids, it starts with the fact that my kid goes to college and he doesn't disconnect from me and he stays, he stays conservative. It stays with how we educate our kids today and it stays about being intentional in the service that we give to others. You can serve your country. God bless everybody that does it. And everybody wants to say, God bless you, thank you for your service, thank you for your service, thank you for your service. They should, but let me tell you what, that same person can serve somebody right next to them today. That same yeah. person can wake up tomorrow and go serve their neighbor. Do you think that I falls not under? Meaning, do you think that falls under? Because you said you went in the state. Do you think that falls under a, a like conservative, or do you think that just falls under being a good person? Because I think we've tried to politicize everything. So, but what do you what what is what I'm does conservative mean to you? Like, I'm done with labels. I'm done right, with labels. I, and I am with you as well, right? It's I think not. you should. It goes back to what you were saying, because I always, especially last year in the middle of all the fucking pandemic out here in California is like, you know, if you watch the news and, and God bless you, if you do, I can't, I can't stomach it. It's just, it's all, it's all about affirmation. It's all about confirmation, not actually like providing any sort of information. Right. But I would always temper it with, you know, if I just led my life based on what the news and whatever your channel of choice is. I would think that I can't go right outside my door and go talk to my neighbor, okay. which I can and which I do, right? Like I can go do that. I can go sit at the pool on a weekend and talk to 20, 30 people who all probably think and live differently than me. And I don't have to worry about anything, right? So I'm kind of falling into line with what you're saying is that the labels at this point, they don't work as any type of thing other than a detriment. They're broken. Yeah, they are. The difference between a Republican and a Democrat or the GOP and the DNC is only the, only, it's the color of their ties. They have the yeah. same common goals. Yeah. They have the same end game. And we can talk about this on a micro level. We can talk about it on a macro level. And then we can talk about uh, Javier's crazy conspiracy theory. Right? Let's go we with Javier's about- crazy conspiracy theory. Let's do that. Um, okay. Well, the one that everybody likes to talk about the most is uh, uh, supply chain shortages. Yeah, this is what I wanted to get into. So you had brought up, I think I heard you say it on Braxton's podcast where it was either you or it might work because you were on with Joe at some point, right? What's that guy's name? Joe. Right. Okay. So either one of right. So either you said it or he said it, or maybe you said it with just when it was just you. But at some point in time, we used to supply everything within like a 500 mile radius, right? Yes, we did. That's what I said. Yeah. Okay. So you said that. And then so now we've gotten into this part where we're reliant on third country or I don't even know if you, we're just reliant on people outside of our sphere of influence, essentially, right? Like we're way well, outside that 500 mile radius. We're reliant on countries and other continents to do something that we used to be able to do ourselves. Right. So um, the, the premise of society, and I said it yesterday, I said I was born in the wrong century because I just, you know, I, I feel responsible for myself. And I feel like if I can't, handle my own business my own business might be uh doing a small electrical repair or yeah. uh, making dinner or something you know just just being a person like living like that idea has been washed out of our society we are being rewarded for doing nothing um you, you don't get a paycheck anymore you get it you get it deposited into your account um you don't have to get sure. do your taxes anymore it electronically can be done you don't have to go to the grocery store anymore you can be dropped off on your doorstep you're actually your sense, a person's sense of, of, of success used to be, I had a really good year because all my kids were fed. I grew great food. Um, I made a great product. I, you know, uh, pick it and you knew everybody around you. Yeah. And now a great year is I got, um, I get 10 million 
you know, I get 10 million uh, influences a month on Twitter. Um, I went on five vacations. I didn't go into a grocery store one time. Um, I, I ordered all my dinners and um, I can play video games and I watch every NFL football game. If, I, if, that, if, that's, if that is what has become sort of this idea of what makes a happy, successful life is doing less. The less I do and the more I consume with doing less, the better I am. And so that's bred by the fact that 30 years ago in Detroit, everybody there worked around uh, some sort of industrialized business, right? So whether yeah. it was cars or automation, or, I mean, Detroit was a great city. Mm -hmm. Detroit, Detroit had, it had a, uh, it had an identity around people who took a lot of pride yeah. in the fact that I work at Ford and I've been there for 20 years. Right. Now Ford automates most everything. They assemble cars in Mexico and Brazil and, you know, they get most of their parts outsourced from different places. And now I happen to have moved recently and I'm near a town. I drove and I saw it yesterday. Uh, not yesterday, uh, what's today, Wednesday, I saw Monday afternoon. Is this in Tennessee? I'm in Kentucky right now. Well, yeah, no, you're talking about the Ford plant, right? It's, there's a Ford plant, Ford truck plant, My about dad drives five by. miles from me. Yeah, yep. there's about five miles from me in, Kentucky, in Louisville. Um, they have a, the, one on 71, though, that all those trucks are still sitting up there. The yep. goodies. I found another one yesterday. Jeez. And it, it, it's them, they're stacked on top of each other, and they're just sitting there. And there's not a lot, there's no sense of pride, right? We basically created a society and, I, and think about it like a, like a, everybody kind of understands what oil refining is. You mm -hmm. take raw oil, you run it through a refiner and out comes the products that we consume. Right. Take that idea and turn China into a refinery. They consume all the raw materials. They repackage them into what we want and they sell them to us at an, at an, at an increase. But they've, cre they've become the world's refinery of all the gluttonous crap we buy. Right? How did that happen though? Tell me that. Tell me how we got um, to the point trade where everything I look at NAFTA, is made in China. NAFTA trade agreements and labor. I mean, you know, for <laughs> you know, the funniest part about all this is that these guys, you know, I I, I despise everything about LeBron James. Everything about him. I'm He's with a you. Horrible on that. human being. Yeah, I agree. I don't, and you know what? You know, I don't care how good he is at whatever he is. No, he's great at his You're sport, not, but he's an absolute bumbling idiot at everything. If he didn't be, if he had no ability to have athletic ability, he, he would just be another dude on the side of the corner, just fucking begging for money. Like he's that right. dumb. He's that maybe, dumb of maybe. a human being. Now I, you've triggered me, Javi. You've triggered right. me. Because okay, I hate we'll LeBron James. Anyway. Well, okay, well, fine. Well, let's talk about China. Let's talk about the money. Let's talk about the yeah. fact that you have, the, you have the balls to stand up for it because. Exactly. Yeah, because, you know, we're sitting Because you don't know what you're talking about, remember? China, like, China, China yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm an idiot. He I'm knows idiot. what he's talking about. You don't because you work in that. You have no idea. If his 12-year-old, if LeBron James's son was working in a factory assembling shoes, I assure you there would be chaos involved. Oh, yeah. All right? If he was forced to work in a factory, but he's got no problem pimping shoes for Nike made by 12-year-olds. I still don't oh, know who buys that their shoe. Who the uh, fuck buys a basketball shoe? I don't understand it. Anyway, that's I, me. Uh, whatever. I get it. There's 350 million people in this country, and there's probably a market for it, but I don't understand. It's literally the most grotesque, ugly footwear you can buy as a, an adult. And the fact that there's a market for that, it really, I don't, I don't see it. I don't get it. I've never met anyone who wears LeBron James shoes. I don't, I don't know. But anyway, all right. So yeah, tell me how the hell China became the world's refinery. They were willing to do everything else for cheaper. Um, probably what year is this? This is 2021. I'm going to tell you sometime around 1985, 90, they realized that they were, they were out of the game. Now, do you believe and, this before you go on, but do you believe like there's this big old theory about how China organizes itself politically, economically, that they think in terms of centuries, they don't think in terms of decades. I know they do. I know. Okay. No, 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 no. It's not, that's, that's not, that's not a thought process. That's a fact. They publish it. Okay. It's, you can read it. Okay. All right. You can read it. It's out there. I'll give it to you. I'll send it to you tomorrow. You can read all. Uh, so, of books, so give me the, give me the cliff notes version papers. of it. Cliff notes version of this is this, is that um, they realize that as so, 50 years ago, China was an agrarian mm -hmm. socialist slash communist country. And right. the average person in China was not a urbanite. They were a rural person 
and they were basically commune farming on some pretty rough ground and they were being given their rations. Okay. China was being left behind after the United States and Russia uh, and Europe were just exploding in industrialized growth. Technology was passing them up and China was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And China funded this entire mass immigration of people from a, 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 an, an agrarian society into an industrialized, urbanized society based upon manufacturing. They basically went around the world and said, wait, what do you do? Oh, you, uh, you make axles. Okay, well, how do we make axles? All right, well, we'll start an axle factory. How much is it, how much is, how much is that axle? That axle costs us $125 to make it. We sell it for $250 to Chevy every single time one of them comes up the line. Oh, how do you make an axle? They go back, they figure out how to make axles. They move these people in, they're communists. They make them move. They put them in a factory. They start cranking out that axle for $18. All right, they sell it for 100. And that's how they started. And that's what they did. And so they, they mass migrated all of these people into an, in, into an, in, um, uh, in, hold on a second. This is Goya's text. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I answer, let me fine. tell you what I answer all the time. I answer her all the time. Um, so they, <laughs> they, they, I don't, I, I'm, I'm married to literally the best woman on the face of the planet, but so we, um, she still didn't tell that story. I'm very disappointed. I'll tell we'll it. Get there. I'll tell it later. We'll, we'll get, get there. there. But so, so we're pushing everything forward, right? China is moving people out, but China at the same time has a, has a population problem, right? And they had the one child policy because they couldn't grow too fast. They, just, they, had, this, they had this whole mentality, right? Of they want to control everything. And, and, and it's hard, like I sound condescending. I don't want to sound condescending, but unless you've dealt with the Chinese on a regular basis, it's, it's hard to describe sort of the mindset of the average person versus an American, the polar yeah. opposite that I, like, we are just absolutely literally the most arrogant people on the face of the planet. And, and That's generally true. speaking, we've kind of earned it. And um, I fall into that category. And, um, but you deal with them and you realize, oh my gosh, they'll do anything that they're told they will. There's no doubt about it. So you've got this whole, now you have an, ur, now you have an, a Chinese population that's becoming urbanized. They're making more steady income and they used to be paid in food. So they, they, I mean, they, they, they farmed, right? And the farming was to feed polite society. It was to feed their population. And you were, you were basically fed, as, but now they have to pay them. So now there's this monetary involvement. So the average wages, and they, look, uh, somebody's gonna be on Twitter and they're gonna say, oh, you know, you're talking about Javier is this. Well, right? that's guaranteed I don't on Twitter. Care, I don't care what you say. The number is this, all right? The number was, the guy was eating what he could, eat in a week plus he was getting a buck all right then he goes and he starts working at the new assembly plant for ford now instead of getting food they decided to pay him 25 dollars a week oh that's wow. sort of how that goes right so he's now rich and now he's urbanized now he's buying shoes now he's spending money on his family and so china had this massive absolute uptick and they had to propel it with growth well in the entire background of this whole process, they now have to figure out how to feed their country. Because now they're not, that, so now they have to, one, they have to commercialize and industrialize their agricultural processes. They, you know, they, they grow corn. They have a corn balance sheet. They grow soybeans. They raise a massive amount of pork, massive amount of pork. They have a problem with pork because they, it ends up, they end up getting viruses over there all the time. Their yeah. pork population goes, they end up exporting pork. And so China is this, is this absolute microcosm and macrocosm of, of economies that is very hard for us to understand because they have sucked and absorbed the life out of our country. We pay them to do it. We pay, we pay them. They are happy to work while we sit over here and do podcasts. All right. Yeah, that's they, fucking funny. So, but sure. why, how did we get to the point where we decided to just be okay with the fact that we gave up that much control most people don't know how much control they've given up because it's a gradual process it's a frog in the pot right i mean okay let me ask you this when i was 20 when i was 19 years old i was getting up at 4 30 or 5 o'clock every morning and i was in southeast wyoming and um when it was time to hay the guy I work for, um, we hayed so much 
that when hay started, I would get on the rake, which is the, the, the all you mm-hmm. ag boys understand that the rake on the open face tractor back in 1995, 90, 91 and 95, I was the rake boy. I was on that rake for 70 hours. They would bring me a cooler with a sandwich in it and a drink. And I raked and I raked and I raked and I raked and I fixed the tines and I fixed the tractor and I fixed the rake and nobody was around. Desolate, nobody around. Mm -hmm. And then the baler would come behind me 12 hours later and then I would be done raking and then I would get in a a 1979 Freightliner cab over truck with a flat, with a 52 foot flatbed on it. And we went around and we picked up hay. And that went on for two weeks, three weeks. That's all we did was hay. And I had the opportunity by the grace of God in a pool table to not have to do that anymore. I became my own problem. I had this massive amount of time on my hands. I had this, I, I, my identity became in what I had and not what I did. My identity became in how much money I made versus, versus you know, whose life did I affect. That is the American problem. And we have been seduced into this idea that we have become a service country of, of yes. like service to ourselves. Yeah. Like, service like, economy. like right. to us, we're a service yeah. economy. We are a consumer economy. We are not a production economy. China was happy to become the producers. We were happy to let them do it. It saved us money. Walmart aided it by, by absolutely 100%. They commoditized retail and they, yeah. they destroyed the notion of the 500 mile radius deal. Right. You know, right. Ford used to put a car together. They used to, Ford, Ford, Ford got their brakes from Delco. At the Delco plant, they got their suspensions from here, they got their steering wheels from here. And you know, a family, a guy, you know, you know, I have a relative who lives in Canada um, uh, from my wife's family. And uh, her sister married into a family and they make saw blades. And, you know, I've I've talked to 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 the, the, the grandfather, you know, he's been running this business, it's generational. And he's like, you know, it's amazing. He goes, he goes, I used to be able to get in my truck in Southeast Canada, and I would drive across the border and I could sell saw blades out of the back of my truck to feed my family. He said, I got to get on the phone now and to meet orders. I'm now having to call China to have them make saw blades for me and put them into a generic label because it costs me too much money to make my in-house saw blades. So I have to carry two, I have to carry a brand and then an off brand to be able to meet my margin. Fuck. Yeah, yeah, and he's one, and, and 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 you know, it's a business where he used to be able to get into his truck and drive around and take orders and fill them, and um and and it's that's where we are. We're, we've become a society that that they you don't know your neighbor, you 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 don't know where your food comes from, you don't know yeah. um, who put together your shoes, you don't you you don't people don't get their shoes repaired anymore. Let me tell you what, go go look around for a shoe repair guy. Yeah, no, that's that's very. Go find a shoe repair guy. Very fucking true. To do boots, yeah. every town's probably got one. And that poor sap, you go into his place and you're sitting there going, "Oh my lord, I need to bring this guy some more shoes," you know, because nobody gets there. They throw everything away. So you're sitting here. I'm sitting here. The only reason I even engage on Twitter, I'll tell you what, this is it. I, I don't ever have to do another podcast. I probably, won't. <laughs> you know, I told you know, Braxton and I walk off shot. We're oh, going to do well, a Hold on b- before you do that. So look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to actually, we're going to get into this tequila. Oh, you're we're going to see what goes really down. It? Yeah, I, it's oh. open. I, I just. I, everything's going to fall. Everything's going to fall apart now. It's fucking if falling apart it, now. That, but yeah, that's usually how it works. Look, I want to see. I'm, I'm not going to have another drink. I want to hear what you did. All right. Hold on. Let's see. Because I got a question. I got a follow up on this whole China thing. Let's see what we got on the nose. Man, that is powerful is what I would describe. <laughs> that's. That is powerful. I'm watching you carefully. I don't want you to go under the, the desk. Uh, well, I think we'll be all right. I'm, I just don't know where the cats are. They might eat me before Maddie gets back. You know? Oh, Lord help They're you. hungry. Oh, wow. Describe it. it it's, there's like this, I guess, like a reverse vacuum of just like smoke. Yeah, that comes out, but there's not an ounce of heat to it. Nope. And that may be just because I drink so much goddamn bourbon, but you know, 104 proof is pretty standard for me with bourbon. I, like, but that there, there's the smoke. There's there's some ash, a little bit of charcoal. 
that is good. Like I can drink that. You know what it reminds me of is uh, Nick got me on this, but it's that uh, that High West Campfire because it's Ooh. a mix of it's a mix of oh. it's a mix of uh, bourbon, scotch, yeah. and uh, the blend. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it it reminds me of that. But this there's something else. I got to get one more. God, what is that note? I'm, I'm, I'm failing to identify that there's something right there on the tip. What do you usually describe when you, when you crush tequila? Is there something that you always come back to as a tasting note? Uh, that, <laughs> it's just smoke, man. I know you said you don't, you don't that's why you don't no. get into it. <laughs> You're no. just like, I just like it. I but you know what? Like it. That's I'm pretty not good, that man. refined. That's really good. I do like that. That's good. All right. So let me get my follow up into you here, right? Ask okay. me a question. I think I'm rambling a little bit, but no, that's fine. But you're you're still on topic, and that's that's what all that matters. Uh, but so my follow up to that before I take you in a completely different direction is how does the United States get out of that, or do we? So okay, I I've I've got so all right. Um, because that also impl- implies everything that you say we have an issue with with our parties. One, right? one, it's not going to happen, and it's a, and it's a, it's a radical thought. Yeah. Um, one, I'm going to put you on main view here. Keep going. There you go. The debt ceiling deal is coming up. Right. I've said this. I'm going to say it again. We need to default, and we need to shut the whole thing down. I'm, I'm of prime earning age, working age, living age. I'm of the age where if there's going to be some pain, I can bear it. And I think my friends can bear it. And I think that people, we, des- we, the people deserve the pain that would come from this. And it could be catastrophic um, in some people's minds. But I think more catastrophic is continuing down the road that we're going down. I think more catastrophic is letting the train continue to gather steam before we go down to the curb that's coming. I'd rather take it now. I'd rather be sort of the downhill mountain pass, uh, semi truck, um, downhill stop. You know, it's going to be ugly. Semi truck's going to go off the road. He's going to go up. He's going to stop. He's going to come back. That's what happens today. So one, I think this entire thing stops without central bank printing. China can't exist without liquidity injections. They're doing it tonight. You know, I just looked at the markets. They're doing stuff tonight. They're messing around, um, put pumping money into the system. China does not exist without central banks funding our pension for debt. All right. So okay. I think that we be, we get we if we can pull the heroin needle out of our arm <laughs> and survive the withdrawals, ah, that's I very- think we come out on the other side of this thing a very happy, healthy country. Because if you you know, there's this notion, right, that it's going to become this. I think, I think that the cure and the disease, I think the disease is worse than people think it is because while they're in it, they think it's okay. Right. It's, the alcoholic never thinks he's an alcoholic until he hits rock bottom. Well, we're alcoholics on money. We're alcoholics on oh, yeah. money. Yeah, All right. Yeah. And, and, but but they, then they also think that the cure or the withdrawals are going to be worse than they really are when you get through on the other side. And I think that that's where we are as a country. And I think that we have to, we have to get off of easy money. We have to get off of easy living. We have to get off of, of everybody else is doing everything for us. It's like, you know, it's like everybody's freaking out because there's not a lot of stuff in grocery stores and the HEBs in Houston or, you know, the Walmart here or this. And so people, it is weird. All right. But it's not weird. People are seeing this and they're, they, they kind of get nervous freaked out about it my entire thing on twitter is three things one i want to be encouraging i don't ever want i don't i don't ever want to look like yeah. i'm being uh, a crazy person right um two i want people to think about things in a different way i want them to understand the big picture the greatest threat to the united states of america is not china it's us we're the greatest yeah. threat to the united states it's us and it's the federal reserve the federal reserve needs to end tonight if we could if i could pull the plug on the federal reserve and jerome powell tonight i would pull the plug on them um by the way rudy haverstein on twitter um, is, 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 is likely the least followed guy in our crowd and yeah. he should be the most followed guy. He dedicates his entire life to, well, what's it, him. what's his account? Let's, let's shout it's, it out uh, there. You said Rudy. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to spell it to you. Spell um, it. It's, 
Hang on here. He's, uh, when I type in, it's funny because when I type in at, it always pops up dump. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't ever type the app sign. Just put the no. name. <laughs> no. I'll tell you what. It's, this, uh, uh, it's Rudy Havenstein. It's, uh, it's, it's at Rudy Havenstein, H-A-V-E-N-S-T-E-I-N. All right. So you oh, can't mess that up. You, Rudy you Havenstein. Need follow, you need to follow him because he's dedicated his entire yeah, Twitter. I must do it right now. To global finance. Um, and he's, and he's, and, and he, he has all the receipts, all the papers, all of the quotes. He has everything. He does it every day relentlessly. And he's thankless. It's thankless. Um, Braxton and I actually engaged with him several times and we try to get him on Braxton's show. And he's like, I'm not doing it. He's like, he's like, I'm not doing it. He's like, when I do 75,000 like, followers, this dude's very popular. He doesn't you need have, us. Well, and he's no, no, he doesn't. I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I'm gonna, Let me yeah, tell you what, haven't what seen. that's his name. You need him. You, you need him. And, and you'll understand why, because and you he said posts. he won't go on Braxton's podcast? No, no, no. He, no, no. no. Not um, his thing. That's cool. No, no. He, no, he does his thing on Twitter and he does it anonymously. Um, but he understands the history of the Federal Reserve as good as anybody out there. But he's dedicated himself to posting the reality of it, where yeah. the crime comes from. What, what does it mean? Like, he, he put, it's, it's educational, right? He'll, he'll post yeah. something out there. And somebody's like, oh, well, you know, well, what are reverse repos? Well, he'll talk about reverse repos. And it's like taking sugar, it's like, it's like taking sugar out of the, uh, you know, it's like taking sugar out of the bakery. It's like when you got too much sugar, what do you do? Though? You go loan it out and you get oh, some back. But oh, long story that's... short, long story short, I think that we have to cut off the free money. I think we have to, I think that, I think that that's the first thing. I think the, you asked me, how does this change? How do we get yeah. off the One, free money. Two, the, two, what can I do and what can you do and what can every person that watches this do to be a part of this? Because all, that right there, it's it going to be done by you and me. That's oh, going to no. be done, yeah, gonna be done by, by, by Joe Kent and Ron. You know, Ron's running for state up in, uh, up in South, South Dakota. Dakota. Yeah. You District know, 31. You know, what up, Ron? District 31. And, 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 and I love that man. And I, I love yeah. the fact that he's also willing to give it up and get in there and fight. And well, that's my guys, other thing, you know, before we get too further and I ask more, questions, but there's, there's plenty of us that need to be doing more of that. Now, I, I so here's what we do. Uh, Braxton's another one. Javier fucking Mackey. There's another one. Like we've got guys in the fucking bullpen that need to get off their ass and go do it. That's what I give the best credit to Joe is like that dude sat in the, on the sidelines for a little bit, just watching us talk about this shit over a year and a half ago. And then they'll one day just hit us all in the chat, like running for Congress. And we're like, what? And now look, yeah. now look, and you try to tell me someone like Braxton with his story and background can't do the exact same fucking thing. Like that's, those are the people we need. We're, we're, we're waiting for someone to come save us and there's no one coming, man. We're the okay. ones that need to save it. Okay. Well, I, I want to be positive about this and I want to think that that can happen. I don't think it is. I think that there's going to, there's the deal for the debt ceiling has already been cut at this point. It's just the showmanship on who's going to do what and they're going to get right. whatever they can out of no, it. You're right. I mean, they're going to run debt it's ceiling gonna showdown used. every fucking year and every, oh, every time. Like, oh, the there's going to be a countdown on whatever your network of choices. Oh. And oh yeah. Y2K. You know, yeah. <laughs> and so we're going to go through that. But I, and I, but I think that the, I think that the, the credit cards need to be cut and the kids need to be put on a budget. Um, two, I think, um, I, I think, I think this notion of us as the world's policemen um, has Man. to change because here's why I'm not, I don't want to get into it. I, I, I let uh, you yeah. guys, you guys, you guys that you listen, you guys, are, so many of you all, you know, I, I was on a spaces while I was driving two weeks ago. Um, yeah. I drove for 36 hours one weekend. I was Jesus. on spaces and grandpa talked for a long time and I sat and listened and I'll tell you what, um, those of you all who are not listening to podcasts, listening to the spaces, and not listening, and they all want to do is chirp and, and, and mm -hmm. put your opinion out there, you're doing yourself a disservice because there's a lot of people here that have a lot of opinions yes. and, and experience on things that I don't have. I've learned more. I've learned, I've learned more in the last year from, from, from you all uh, mm -hmm. than, than, I, than I think I've taught you all. I don't think I've right. teaching anybody anything. I think I, think I, just, I think I just have this 30,000 foot view of things that most people don't have. <clears throat> yeah, and, well, that's why um, it's important. That's why there's value to that. There's value to it, but but it, but it's coming from a simpleton, right? But you guys have got these these stories that have blessed me and made me a better person, right? And so, I'm what I'm thinking, and, and the only reason I'm even here, the only reason my face is even on here tonight, is 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 that I believe the only, there's only two there's only two outcomes. The train keeps going down the road, and it wrecks when it wrecks when we don't want it to wreck, 
Right. It wrecks when somebody else wrecks our train force. It wrecks when somebody puts a penny on the track yeah. and it derails. The fucking train goes wherever. Yeah. It's going to derail. The yeah. train and either 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 somebody else is going to derail our train or we're going to derail our train. Because that train is very know fragile when you gonna... think about it. When you we use that analogy, there's a very fragile. It, it's yeah. not hard to derail a train, unfortunately. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, and so my only goal is to make sure that the people in, in, in my life, whether they're they're my neighbor, whether they're a person, you know, that that I don't like, you know, whether they're my my sons and daughters, friends, parents, whether the the administrators at school, whether it's the back office girl in my office I've never spoken to, whether it's you, <laughs> whether it's your, you know, whether it's your family, whether it's your daughter, whether it's whoever it is. Right. If I can impart any type of of knowledge i you know some people might call it wisdom some people might call it knowledge some people might call it whatever and everybody always wants they you know i get these weird questions from people like well what should i do to be preparing what can i do to change things what can i do to make a difference the average person the biggest difference they're ever going to make is in their kids lives yes too many people today are letting other people raise their kids either emotionally spiritually um educationally um you know, outcome in college and, and people have given up on that. And, and I'm, and I'm a, and I, I did that the yeah. first 10, 15 years of my life with kids, I was running, I was never home. I was on the plane. I was gone. I was out. I, I thought it was more important for me to be in a bar or at a dinner or a client dinner or, or in a meeting or doing whatever, you know, I thought that that was going to make a difference in, in my life, you know, monetarily and by virtue of me making more money my kids would be better. My wife would be better. And, 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 uh, you know, a while ago, one night I was looking for something, uh, in my house and, um, I found a drawer in my house in Texas that, um, I'd never looked in before. Oh, wow. And in that drawer was about 40 books. And I started looking at the books and I'm like, what are these books? And I was like, I've never seen these before. I start reading the titles. And the titles were how to live, how, 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 to, how to love a man who doesn't love you. What the? F- how, to, how to teach? How to, how to teach? How to teach? How to teach your husband to be yeah. a better dad? Right. So just stuff it's about you being absent. Titles. Yeah. For you being my wife, absent. My absent. Yep. Uh, unfa- uh, not unfaithful. I've never. Right. I've never. I've never been an unfaithful person. I. I, I you were absent. That, you were absent, but she was absolutely. trying to bring. She was trying to find a way to bring you back. Physically, emotionally, yeah. physically spiritually, leadership wise, was yeah. I a leader? I thought my leadership was coming home saying, you know what? We can have a bigger house. We can have a little car. We can yeah, yeah. You know, all of those things. And I just sat there and, you know, Rex and Rex and jokes around about it. He's like, it really annoys me when grown men cry, but I did. He did. No, you know there. what? That annoys the no, fuck out did. of me too, because no, you know what, Braxton, I get it. And I get where he's probably coming from with it, but look, dude, I like, Man, I was just up in Chicago with my daughter at the Cubs game watching the Giants because we went right. But it was 9-11. And they did about yep. they did a they did probably like a a good 12 minute like 9-11 presentation. And I'm not sitting there like just openly allowing it. I can't control those fucking tears coming down my eyes. You know what I mean? Like I can't control I that shit. And I, I can pick, I can see out of the corner of my my eye, my daughter, you know, looking up because she can see it affect. She knows. Like we've been to the tower site before. Like she knows how impactful that was to just the United States, but also to me. Um, so look, man, look, Braxton can clown that shit all he wants, but you know what? That that's that's no, a he's right. Uh, there's the context a, there's a difference. of crying and and just you know. There's a difference. I wept. Uh, I literally sat there, and my life changed that day. And uh, yeah. and I realized, and every every everything that I everything that I strove for, right? Everything that I thought was going to make me a better person or a better dad or a better husband. It was just gone. Like in, in that instant, yeah. my faith in my faith in Jesus and God changed that night. I realized that, that I realized that I'm just I'm just this dude, right? I'm just a guy who's where, I've become where, where really did you good. Meet, where did you meet I've that woman really though, real quick? Failing. Um, was that so, at the same bar you got your job at? All right, so um, because <laughs> we got to get this body, in. I'm 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 working hard and I'm running hard, yeah. hard. I mean, I'm like, I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, these guys are just like writing me checks. <laughs> and I'm going, oh my gosh. I mean, I've got stories. I wrote a story, I put it out right around Christmas, talking about me running around. This is about the same time about uh, uh, my oldest brother was in Los Angeles. 
and um, he invites me out to come visit him. And this is right. This is before I met Miss Goya. <laughs> but I'm running hot because I think I'm like the cat's meow. You know, I'm making mm -hmm. money. I mean, these guys, I'm getting a check, right? A real check. Like I'm, yeah. I'm like getting, like they're going, and I'm going. I'm just talking to people on the phone. Like I'm just going buy it, sell it. I'm going. Oh, well, that looks cheap. I'll buy that. And I'm going. Oh my gosh. I end up out in Los Angeles, and I end up, I end up squared up. Uh, on Hugh Hefner's pool table at the Playboy Mansion <laughs> in a suit with my oldest brother. I'm at a, by the way, you'll appreciate this. It was a scotch tasting. Oh, shit. I was, I was at the, so the head, so my oldest brother was at UCLA Business School at the time after he mm. got out of the military. And um, uh, he got invited to the school to go to this deal where it was the head blender from Johnny Walker. Opened oh, up wow. the first bottle of blue and the first bottle of gold in the United States at the Playboy Mansion. I was there. Oh, shit. <laughs> I hated scotch. Oh, I night. still do. I still do. And I, there's a Twitter thread out there somewhere that I wrote one night. And, I uh, hate blended scotch. Let's be honest. Oh, That's awesome. what I Well, hate. here's what they did. It was, actually, it was actually interesting. So what they did is they set this little place card in front of you, and it had a circle on it and shot glasses, and they weren't yeah. full shot. It was a small shot, and it was yeah. the different individual scotches that were yeah. blended. Right. And it had a description and the blender went through and he's like, well, this is how we came up with this. Well, I took one sip and I raised my hand to the little girl in the back and I said, I'm going to need you to go find me something. I need a glass. I need ice. And I need something to pour this in. And then she goes, what do you want? I was like, I don't care. Bring me a Diet Coke, a ginger ale, whatever. She brings me a ginger ale. She brings me a tumbler and she brings me a, a, a small bucket of ice. And I sat back there and I drank me some, some Johnny Walker's and ginger ale on ice. <laughs> I, I when and, and this guy he rambled on with a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. I'm just going, and I was like, just keep filling them up. I'm just yeah. getting hammered, hammered. <laughs> I'm 19. I'm 19 years old. <laughs> I'm not even old enough to be there. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm literally lighting this stuff up. I mean, it, it's awful. And uh, it kind of ends. We have kind of a dinner. They brought me a little plate of salad. I'm like, this is terrible. And I, I left. And uh, so Hugh Hefner was married at the time. And so the wife that he was married to, and anybody who wants to call BS on me, you would look this up. She would only allow two playmates on the property at, at, at any given time. Mm -hmm. So there was two playmates there. <clears throat> and they showed up at the scotch tasting and walked around and did whatever. Well, I kind of wandered off. And uh, I ended up kind of wandering back around this place. By the way, it's unbelievable. He's got an aviary, he's got birds. I went down into the grotto, but I'm hammered, right? I end up in his pool room <laughs> and I played pool with the two playmates. Pool, I'm not a good pool player, <laughs> but I played pool Seems to be with the uh, another guy. piece of all your life, man. I played pool with two playmates and another dude. Um, it was, they were very nice. It, it, it was not some sort of a crazy deal. I'm wearing a yeah. suit, which I didn't own one. I went to uh, I went to like a Stein Mart and paid like <laughs> sixty bucks for a suit to do. I look, I mean, I'm a fish out of water, but I'm having a great time. I'm fun. Yeah. I mean, we're laughing, we're we're joking around or whatever. This whole night goes on, and um, my brother grabs me and he's like, "Oh, we got to get out of here. This is this is over. You're crazy. You're out of your mind. Let's go." So we get into his car, brand new car, brand new convertible Mercedes. We're cruising to LA, and he's just like he's got the music going. It's like Guns and Roses are blaring, and we're going. And I'm like, "Oh, great." He's, a, he's way more of a prima donna than I have ever been. And I'm sitting here going, oh, gosh, where are we going? We pull up to the Beverly Hills Hotel. We were going into uh, Hamilton Cigar Bar, but you have to Valley Park. One, I don't think, I think this was the first time I'd ever been into a Valley parking line. Two, I have no idea where we're going. I'm hammered. <laughs> Three, I'm in no shape to be going anywhere. And the Valley guy opens my door. I'm in the front right-hand seat, and I turn my head to the side, and I vomit, and I <laughs> hit the valet parking guy at his belt buckle. Holy! <laughs> True story. That's my life. All right. So that's that's, that's sort of one. how this is going. This is how I'm running. I'm just trying to give you a description of how I am going. <laughs> I get a phone call on a third on a Friday afternoon. And there's a girl that was here in Kentucky who I knew through work. Um, wasn't just one of those things. I was I didn't know who she was calling me. Yeah. And she's like, hey, how are you? It was great. She's like, hey, what are you doing tonight? Where are you going to be? And I knew her socially. And I said, well, I'm not really doing anything. And she's like, well, I need you to come meet somebody tonight. 
I said, what? She said, yeah, go meet me at the bar. Just come down there if you can. Um, Why'd she, she pick you? Very simple. And I hope Clay's watching this. All right, Clay, Clay, I hope you're watching. <laughs> so what I have not, what I don't publicly disclose a lot is that I had a daughter out of wedlock. Okay. Um, and at this point in time, I'm sitting here in a knockdown drag out fight over her. And she's about nine months old. Um, I'm still running hard. I still think, you know, oh, well, you know, what, whatever's going on. The yeah. reason she picked me is that, is that Mrs. Goya was a single mom. Ah, okay. So she knew she you had guys kind of needed each other. She had an accident in college. Yep. I had an okay. accident in college. We both had these things happening to us and we we're both single parents. Yep. And I said, all right, well, maybe I'll be down there. Maybe I won't. My best friend and I were running around. I said, you know, I got a weird phone call today. Let's go down to this bar. So, all right, let's go. We get down there. We walk in. I met her. And uh, um, she had a son. And uh, I had a daughter. And we met. And we talked for maybe she laughs about this. But an hour into it, I looked at her. And I said, this is going to work out. And she said, yeah, I think it probably will. And uh, I tell people, I knew, I knew within about 15 minutes of meeting her that I'd marry her. And uh, we did. We married a year later. Um, her son and my daughter were the, were the wedding people. We got married in Lake Tahoe um, with about 10 what? people. Oh, people. damn. So you do That's, come to Tahoe. Let's go. I do come to Tahoe. I was in Tahoe last year. Uh, uh, we got hey, married there. If you're ever here, hey, married. next time you're here, you better hit me up. It's a two-hour oh, yeah. drive. Let's go. I was there. I was there last July. Um, but uh, okay. we got married up there. We had kids. And, uh, and you know, uh, 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 Clay, I'll tell you what, it was the best decision I ever made. It changed my life. Oh yeah. Changed my life for her. Changed my, changed my life for, uh, for my stepson who's never been my stepson. I, I say stepson for him. And I just kind of like cringe because he's not my stepson. Yeah. That's he's been my son since the day I met him. Yep. And that was the same bar. That was the same bar that I got my job in. How? F and, and, and Saturday <laughs> night and listen to this, listen to this Saturday night, um, this past Saturday night, that girl and her husband and her kids, um, we're, we're at my um, rental house that I have here. I haven't bought, I'm building a farm um, up here in Kentucky. Um, but that same girl is still my wife's best friend. Your wife's best friend, yeah. Uh, yep, and she is still there. And, and about a year ago, I called her. And, uh, and uh, it was a random phone call. I'm like, I was, I was on the road. I'm on the road a lot for rodeo yep. and for my son. And uh, I don't know why I did. I just put her, I, I called her up and I said, hey, you know, I said, I didn't tell you something. I said, I don't know why you decided to call me. I don't know why you did it. I said, but you changed my life. I said, you, you, you changed my entire trajectory by calling yep. me and inviting me to that bar. And I want to thank you. And I want to tell you that, that you're a great friend to her and you're a great friend to me. And, uh, and you, yep. you changed my life. And I, said, and I said, she changed my life. I said, but you really changed my life. Because if I hadn't met her, um, I would have probably been in, in prison or dead. And, uh, uh, and that's the truth. That's a true story. And um, that's where we are today. And, and my entire family, everyone defers to her. She is the boss. She's the faithful one. She has direct line to Jesus. Um, she's the most kind, humble, honest, hardworking person I've ever met. Um, she's done more for middle school kids. She's, uh, she's a mentor to middle school kids. She's, uh, uh, she has master's degrees in social work and child psychology. Um, and, and she's the most selfless, kind, giving person. She's the exact opposite of what I was for so long. And when I realized that all of her prayers for her and her family were me as a husband and a father to um, step up and stepping up is not just providing, stepping up yeah. is providing emotionally, stepping up is providing it about, and about how you are as a man. Right. And so I look at it, I'm sitting here going, all right, what, what, how's my life changed? What do I do now? Like, okay. So now I've, I have a story I'm not going to tell um, that story changed my life too. And, and I realized that I was going to be tapped out on my ambition because I made, a, I, made the, I made the decision to be an honorable person. Right. It's very hard. It is very hard to go above a certain level and, and, and be an honorable person. It's very, hard, it's very hard to make a billion dollars and be an honorable person. You got to make a lot of choices and most of them are wrong. Yeah. I chose the other way. And so you say, well, what can you do? Well, I'll tell you what you can do. When I, my journey started after that night when I found those books and I searched for a year, I wrote my wife, uh, I wrote my wife a letter every day for 365 days. What? Wow. Yep. I wrote her a letter every day in books. I have them. She has them books. I filled books. 
Some days I'd write her a letter, it'd be a paragraph. Some days I'd write her a letter, it'd be 10 pages long, little books. And a lot of it was therapeutic for me. A lot of it yeah. was therapeutic for her. A lot of it was about our kids and about, and about, and, and, and a lot of it was uh, building up her because I'd spent so long you, uh, taking advantage of her, of her giving personality. Well, I view my view of, of our marriage and saving it because she, she couldn't do it much longer. You know, I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh, you're rich. You can do whatever you want. You can travel where you want, you do what you want. She's like, I don't want, I don't want rich. I want a life. And, and, and in finding that, I realized several things. One, the role of men and their families, including me. And I only, I'm not saying this because I'm right. I'm saying this because I was dead wrong. For whatever reason, I was wrong. Mm-hmm. The role of men in society today has changed to the point where um, it, we're not breeding kids that have an example of what to do. Society's telling them what to do. Society's telling them how to be. Yeah. That's why you have people going into Congress. That's why you have people who don't know how to work. That's why you have kids living in basements. That's why you have kids in college that can't stand up for their own beliefs and their own rights. That's why you have these people that make these absolutely ludicrous mental decisions that Second Amendment, First Amendment, um, government knows better. You know, all of the different things that we rail against all day long, mm-hmm. trying to find yeah. hypocrisy. And it starts at home. It starts with understanding the family unit. It starts with understanding God starts to understanding what faith means. It starts to understanding and grunt, Paul, I hope you watch this because he said something that has stuck with me. And I've told him this a couple of times. There's a difference between legalism and moralism. Way too many times we're so caught up in what legalism is and whether it's legal or whether it's not legal. And this is why I hate libertarians. Yeah, oh, and we yeah. don't define morality. Yeah, We don't define morality and we don't define service. Service to others is a lost thing. As long as it's service to me, I'm happy if I have to serve you. If you call me up and say, hey, I need you to do something for me, most people are like, oh, great. If it's your friend, he's going to do it. But instead, I should be going, hey, how do I serve you? I want people to, well, that's, want to that's, start in their that's, home that's, and serve their wife, their kids. That's, servant, and then, that's, the, and go that's out. the basis of servant leadership, right? Like what you're describing. That's servant leadership. It's, a, it's servant leadership. And yeah. so two things are going to happen. Train's going to derail one way or the other. Yep. It's either going to derail because we decided as a country that we've had enough and the people in power are no, are, they are afraid of us, which they should be. They shouldn't want to be there and they should be working in our best interest. Or it's going to be derailed when we don't want it to be derailed. I believe that's a lot closer than, than, than it's ever been by an astronomically small margin. Like mm. there are so many, like Afghanistan, I believe, and this is conspiracy theory hobby. I believe the withdrawal from Afghanistan was orchestrated and demanded by China. I believe that, um, I believe that the, at the very base of it, they continue Belt and Road and they get to get down to the water. I think that they get their rare earth minerals that are in Afghanistan. Oh, that's been going on. That's not a conspiracy that's, theory. That started that's been the going on. That, of course it's been going on. But and, you know, and people, uh, you know, a couple of different people and, 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 and the guy that I'm really the most upset about, like my interaction with over the last week is Mike Shelby, great gray zone war, whatever. Mike Shelby's his name. Um, he's so insightful. He makes so many great intelligence things. And the, the thing that hangs him up the most is my anti-crypto strategy, my anti-crypto stance. That's a whole yeah, I was going to get to that. I was going to ask you that. So go for We'll talk for about it. it later. But, you know, he has so many great ideas and I think he has, I think he really understands Sort of the macro scheme i think he sees it thirty thousand feet so for me at thirty thousand feet what i see is and after dealing with china almost every day for the last 24 years is i understand that one they hate us two they want everything in front of us two they're using three they're using um um uh, debt to colonize i call it debt colonization i've said it before i'll say it again they use infrastructure, energy, raw materials, rare earths, and they put these infrastructures in roads and airports and factories in these poor countries. And then when they, they know they can't pay them back, they default, they end up with them. And it's to do a couple of things. One, to feed their country. They can't feed their country. They have a program that's active at Texas A&M for the last 15, 20 years. And they, they work with Monsanto, Cargill, Bungie, the world's top ag companies, Louis Dreyfus. And, and, and A&M and, and other universities. I only know of A&M, I know there's more. And they're working on seeds that they can grow um, um, stable crops in Africa and other arid 
plains areas, right? So the step in Eurasia, the step in China and in Africa, right? Because they can't feed their people. They need Brazil, they need the United States, they need the Ukraine, like they need these hey, there's areas, our power, right a bread there. basket, right? Yep. And, and they're willing to do what we are willing to do. Um, we are sitting here making, you know, I, I don't want to get into it, but the whole military thing is just, it's, it's, it's funny that, that there are people that truly believe that this whole, um, you know, left push for the change in our military and our government for the race equity and the LGBTQ, like that, 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 that serving that segment of our population via these organisms and organizations is benefiting literally anyone. Because it truly doesn't. I mean, giving lip service to a certain segment of the population as a general in the military is not serving anyone other than himself. Why? Well, here's why. There are people who think that I'm an absolute lunatic, but I'm, I've sat at the bar and I've sat in the restaurants and I've, and I've been in the meetings and I've heard the deals discussed and I've heard the absolute worst that these people are willing to do. When people say nobody would think like that, they're lying to you. Oh, they yeah. absolutely think yeah. exactly the worst. Mm -hmm. And the end goal is absolute power. Our administration, current administration, does not view China as an enemy. They view them as a, um, uh, uh, they envy them. They look up to them. They want the, they want the authoritarian power and they want to be in that sort of a ball game. And they're willing to do whatever it takes to push us into sort of that, that view. People say it's globalist, it's reset, it's all these different things. That's I fucking, think it is. That's completely but, counter to like the entire founding. Like that's counter to our entire national history. Stop thinking that people in the government today, stop thinking that they view the world like you view it. They do not view yeah. it like you view it. They view it from, their, from a perspective that it took me a very long time to figure it out. And, and, and I'm going to get into it a little bit. I'm not going to get into too much, but I sat at a dinner in Houston, Texas in 2009. And at this dinner, there was two guys. One was a lawyer, one was not. They had asked me to do an oil deal for them. And the, the gist of the oil deal was that I was going to help secure transit. I was going to offload oil from a Middle East country that was of questionable status. It was not Iran, just to be very, very freaking clear. There was no embargoes. There was, it was completely blue skied. Mm -hmm. They asked me to do this deal where I was then going to take the oil. I was then going to um, put in a place what's called a tolling agreement with a refinery. A tolling agreement is a throughput agreement and not hard to do. And, and I was going to then be able to take the products. I was going to sell the products, certain products back to the country where I got the oil from. And then I was going to be able to take a certain segment of the, pro of the products and sell them in the open market, which is more along the lines of what I do. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting at this dinner and I'm going, this is amazing. This is amazing. This is amazing. I'm going, okay. I'm doing the math on the back of the napkins and I'm going, okay. And I started asking some questions like, okay, well, we got to call the state department. Um, I need to call the Department of Energy. And they're like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And anytime somebody tells me, don't worry about it. I worry about it. So yeah, I'm, going, should. <laughs> I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And without going in, okay. I'll probably be off Twitter tomorrow, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. <laughs> one <laughs> of the, I don't one want of, you to be off Twitter tomorrow. One of the guys sitting, one of the guys sitting at the, at the dinner table was one of uh, Marmar Gaddafi's sons in the country was Libya. And, um, my question that I directly asked is I said, okay, why is the NFC giving us oil at a little bit of a discount? Not a lot. It was a little bit of a discount and why they want the products back. Yeah. At the end of the day, the two people sitting at the table and I found this out the next day because I realized I was, I realized like the only blessing I've got 
And even in my most megalomaniac, hubris-fueled um, life, where I was really running hot, partying, out, in, I've always realized that I am just the dumbass at the table. And I sat there at this dinner and I'm going, what, wait, hold on. What's going on here? Something's not right. And right. I realized I'm probably being recorded. Yep. Um, I'm probably being set up. And, I'm, and my, my conspiracy brain says, oh my gosh, I'm the, I'm the sucker at the Vegas table because this is all too good to be true. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm going to make $20 million. And I'm going, part of me is going, oh my gosh, this is great. Part of me is going, why me? Turns out the two guys at the table, and I ain't naming names, um, one of them was, 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 was Joe Biden's lawyer and the other one was um, George W.'s fixer. And um, that deal, they're all on the same team, bud. Yeah. E everyone at that level is all on the same team. They're all involved. And there's, there's, there's no red, there's no blue. And people, you know, and it's funny because people will be it's like, pendulum, oh, you're a, right? you're, a, you're a trumper. You're a trumper. Are you kidding me? I'm a Javier Goyer. <laughs> you know who I am? I'm, I'm my neighbor's friend. All yeah. right. So I do, I think at times have the ability to affect things at a different level. I do have access to politicians. Mm. Um, not what I would have had if I'd said yes to that. It took me two yeah, years. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Took me, I mean, yeah. eventually, I mean, you know how that ended up. Yeah. There was no deal to be had eventually right. because a year and a half later, that was over. Yeah. But you foresaw gone. that though. You would, you would. No, least... I didn't foresee that. I did. I didn't foresee that. I did not. Not that, that, but you at least had the no. spidey sense to not go forward. Right. Oh, 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 that was it. That night, yeah. that changed my life. That, that night changed my life. That yeah. night changed my life. It would have gone very differently. I, if you I just realized. Like, Let's just go. Let's do that. Like, yeah. Woo. I realized that I realized that night that I was not cut out to be that person. I realized that I'm just, I'm just, and I realized, I think I re it took me a while to realize because I kind of thought, you know, at the time I, I didn't really realize it, but I didn't realize that I'm just kind of this, I'm just, the, I'm just the average guy just trying to figure out how to raise my wife, my kids and love my wife. And like, and, and there's this whole world out here that tells you that, that more is better. Yeah, but well, you're I'll tell you, in that, I'll tell you, though. But so that you I can't was. discount. I've been that. in it. You can't discount the fact that you have a place in it. I do have a place in it. I don't anymore. I'm excluded. I mean, after that, it kind of went like I like my job, like my life today. I mean, it's still great, right? I still do these things, but I stopped chasing, right? And shortly yeah. after that is when I found these books and my life changed, right? So I still do my job. You know, I don't. Yeah, I don't but you've run seen and chase and that that you you you, you I can't. Sat at the table. You'll never lose. Yeah, right. You sat at that table. No, You're at never going to lose that experience or that knowledge. Like you I've know at, how to pass that on to other people. That's that's one of many. And let me tell you yeah. something, Eric. And 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 that's that's the one that changed me. The rest of them were things that I just kind of like either went along with and sort of like just kind of nodded my head or ones right. that I vote. But I never I, like that was the one. That's the one that changed yeah. my life. And, and, and at that point, I realized that the game that we're involved in, we're pawns in, we don't have a seat at the table. I saw the table. I ate at the table, but I wasn't invited. I was invited to the VIP room, but I didn't go. All right. I got invited and I don't want to be back there. And I don't, and, and I don't think what happens in that room is good for this country. I don't think it's good for, for, for my family. I don't think it's good for you. I don't think it's good for my friends. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's good for Braxton or, Lee or, 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 or any of the guys that I've become friends with, you yeah. know, people that, people that I trust, people that I would, you know, you know, and I know this is cliche, but you know, I, I have become friends with Braxton. My, my third son is going to go live with him when he turns 16 years old for a wow, summer. He's going to go work for him. He's going to go bust his butt and work for him because, because you know what? Our kids need men in their lives. And you and, and and you know I've said I I, I I can give my my agriculture son enough, but he needs to go get it from somebody else. And I, and you know you that's need powerful, people in your life that's, that's, that can do that. Yeah, that's 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 pretty powerful. So, but really but that's is. not. But so at the end of the day, I, so there's my experience, right? I told you this. I'll never tell it again. I'll probably be kicked off Twitter tomorrow. I'll be fine. I don't care. Uh, I don't need Twitter. But I will tell you this. The only reason I say that is that one, it's verifiable. Everybody questions me on some of the things. Um, mm -hmm. I have the receipts. Two, <laughs> two. It 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 gave me this perspective, right? When the train comes off the tracks, 
and it really it got me thinking like i'm not prepared for the train train to come up today. nobody is right you can't. nobody is how could you be prepared for that there's no, you can't be prepared no. For fucking society just end as you know no. it. there's no perfect scenarios there's no nope. there's no perfect ending there's no um mm. you know there's not but but there are things that you can do one um you know the first thing i think is 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 and and i know that this is a very polarizing state but I do believe that, that, that faith, I am a Christian and I believe in Jesus. And, mm. and, and I, I try to live that every day of my life. Tomorrow morning, 5.30 a.m., I'm going to a men's, a men's Bible study. All right. That, for me, gives me the guardrails on my life that I need mm. to make sure I'm pointing in the right direction. Right. The problem that we face as a society is that anything goes. Libertarians, anything goes. Anything goes. Well, if anything yeah. goes, everything goes. And at some point, you don't know what you're fighting for. You don't know what that's, you're raising. That's your why with. the libertarians are they're the total fucking scam. Total scam. And, and total and worthless. There, there are there. Uh, you know what? There, a big segment of them makes a lot of the good that's in there bad. Yeah. Just because they ruin it for guilt by association. But that's not my yeah. point. My point, my point more is this, is that I think that if people can't find faith in something, obviously I believe in, I, I believe in God. But most people don't have faith in anything. Most people have faith in themselves and how good they can shoot or hunt or do whatever. I'll tell yeah. you what, yeah. I'm glad they do. I'm so glad they do because I don't have a lot of faith in myself. My faith comes from someone else because if without it, I'm nothing. And, and I'm just a guy and that's okay. I'm happy being just a guy. And I think that the service aspect, the service leadership, if we're not doing that in our families, if we're not doing it in our schools, if you aren't, if you are not asking your kid's teacher, if you're just going to go on Twitter and complain that your kid oh, yeah. That's is in where we're at. doing this, but if you are not at your kid's school once a week or emailing your kid's teacher saying, how can I support you? How can I be of service to you? Can I come in? Can I help you? Can I, yeah. can I, can I buy you I dinner? Can I, yeah. show, you know what? I'm coming through carpool line and I'm not going to put my kid on the bus. I'm going to bring my kid to school on the bus on Friday morning. Or I'll take mm -hmm. him off the bus. I'm going to drive to yeah. school. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go by Starbucks. Can I run my kid in and bring you a coffee mm -hmm. before school? Yeah. Can I bring you a gift certificate for a $10 sandwich and Chick-fil-A? Can yeah, I, yeah. can I, and, 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 and we don't do it, but we, but we're happy to complain and moan and cry and say the system works against us instead of figuring out how to be a part of the system. Yep. And so no, you're I think that right. happens. You're absolutely Two. right. Three. All right. We're going to do a, we're yeah. going to do a, we're going to do a Nothing. very like complete 180 shift here because there's a couple of things I wanted to ask you about one you brought Hit up, me. but two, I wanted to kind of get your take on this because we, we you know, we spent a lot of time talking about China. Um, and one of the sites, I assume, well, I won't assume you, but are you familiar with that site on Twitter or the account the disclose.tv? Of course. Okay. So one of the things they put out earlier today is that um, they, they've managed to tie down and attribute to a Chinese defector that the, I guess you, you want to call it the COVID or whatever the fuck people call it these days, that they can attribute it to being um, purposely administered during the 2019 military world games that took place in wuhan when i tell you that or if you saw it yourself what 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 was your reaction or what is your reaction to me telling you that in terms of not only was the location kind of conspicuous um but it being essentially intentional I mean, I, it, I saw it and I just kind of nodded my head. I mean, I, I, I don't think we're ever going to learn the whole truth, but I think that's probably right. closer to the truth. I think that, uh, man, Lee posted a, or he didn't post, he shared an article. I think it was in the Atlantic of all places. Yeah. And it was like a 40 minute read. It was. Yeah. Of how they like tied it down to that, to this lab in Wuhan and correct that they went all the way back to these guys who were, you know, collecting these samples in these fucking caves and within six months they were all dead or something crazy just like along that lines but when, when i start with when when there are people i say the left but i don't really necessarily just mean the left i mean yeah because you've already people in power like when, there's, this is all, when there's an influence when there's a person on the same of power team, right? and influence screaming at me screaming at me a narrative mm -hmm. i'm just gonna i'm gonna assume one of two things one if they're screaming at me that donald trump is, is a russian operative it tells me that russia is involved with them 
if they're screaming at me that China had nothing to do with this and it's naturally born, then I'm going to assume it was, it was made in a lab yeah. in China. If they are screaming at me that I have to take this vaccine, screaming at me, you have to take it. I'm going, whoa, hold on. I am not an anti-vax person. My kids have been vaccinated. Yeah. Everything's on there, but I'm going, whoa, hold on. The same people, the same people that have screamed at me as in, like I'm an imbecile about everything and everything that they've screamed about has come back and turned around and been wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm all go, I'm going to hold up here and wait. And I'm going to just, let's just see what happens here over, over some time yeah. before I start putting stuff in my body. I'm going to wait. Thank you. That's fine. And so when I see those articles, I'm going, Hmm. Okay. Um, Zero hedge was banned from Twitter for even making that assumption. I haven't seen it. Were they? Because I haven't seen that fucking account. Zero in a Hedge Damn, was banned okay. from Twitter at the beginning of COVID for making the assertion that it was a laboratory derived uh, yeah. virus. Then, it, then they relied back on Twitter, I guess, six months later. Yeah, months okay. Later. That makes sense. So, so that happened. And I don't know. I mean, look, I, I'm, it's kind of hard for me to sort of, you know, do I know? I don't know. I'm sitting here. I'm going, I don't know. But does it make sense? It makes sense. Yeah. Um, their reaction to it early on absolutely makes sense. Their reaction to it today makes sense. The deals they cut during it makes sense. The way they treated their natural resources and commodities during COVID, it makes sense that they knew all along kind of what was going to happen. Everybody seems to think this sort of thing is on a J curve up. The next shoe has not dropped yet. I say that. Which I, I think you know. talked about. You talked about probably like a, what, a month and a, maybe a month and a half ago. I think you were you were calling for something, and I don't know if it necessarily happened, but I feel like you're you're I'm always calling for stuff. Sometimes yeah, but you, I mean, you're predicting based off of what you see, and so when you say that now, what mm -hmm. are you, what are you talking about? Well, I mean, they're absorbing raw materials at a, at a at a at a rate. Somebody sent me an article today talking about China. Oh, I know what it was. It was their the Bloomberg girl from uh, uh, or no, her name is uh, Shy 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 girl or something like that she shy girl. She's, a, she's an oil commentator okay and they sent me what she said today and she's talking she posted an article where a hedge fund deal is talking about china is not the last the, is not the buyer of last resort and i'm going okay hold on when finance people start trying to tell me that china is not the buyer of last resort for resources of food and energy and oil and gas i'm like okay something's getting ready to happen um you know they did a they did a strategic oil release um, from their oil reserves, you know, two or three weeks ago or two weeks ago. And um, I think it was to push the price of oil down to buy more. I don't know. They didn't really release enough that it was a big deal. But, um, but you know, these little tiny things happen, right? So you get, you get all these little tiny flags, right? So, so, so when you try to dumb down the 30,000 foot level, this is what I like yeah. to do. And yeah. I think you can imagine this. Yeah. I like to take a handful of those little flags that like the, the linemen use and the, 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 the guys yeah, in the yeah. underground <laughs> utilities use, right? You got a red flag, you got a yellow flag, you got green flags, right? So I'm not smart enough to figure out what the whole story is. So I take a little flag in my brain and I'm like, okay, here's a red flag. That's a red flag over there. Sometimes I change that red flag to green. Sometimes I change it to yellow, sometimes or whatever. But I, my goal in life is that I don't ever want to turn around behind me and see nothing but red flags that I walk yeah. right past them and I right. move past them. So I start, at whatever I'm told, and I work my way backwards. And that 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 that's with all of them. It, it is. I don't take MAGA things at face value. I think there's as much BS coming from that as there is everyone else. Nobody yeah. knows the whole story. I don't know the whole story. All I know is the people involved are willing to do more than I'm willing to do. I determined a long time ago that I do not have what it takes inside of me to take that left hand turn. I'd rather take right turns and be wrong. Yeah, and take a left hand turn and be whatever. Right, and which goes they're back to what you were talking to about when you were turns. at the table. Right, yeah. Okay. They're all willing to take left hand turns. I'm not, and so I have to prepare myself and for my family, and I have to prepare my neighbors, and I have to be a service guy for like, well, what does it look like when the world takes a left hand turn and I'm sitting here? Well, okay, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what we always talk about. Let's talk about, you know, what what does it look like? It it you know, and then I I told you the entire reason I'm in the only entire reason I know everybody here on Twitter is because of Clay's book. A friend of mine gave it to me. <laughs> yeah. hey, you need to read this. You, you live, I got the book. You live in, it, of course, I read Concrete it. Jungle. Yeah, You're I got it. You need to read this book. Uh, yeah. You're in, you know, you live in, you live in the inner, inner, in the, inside the loop in Houston. And yeah. You need to read it. this book. Read it. 
Absolutely. I read the book. I go on Twitter. I find the guy. I read it before I had him on. I had him on. That's like my most popular episode ever. Probably. Yeah, Yeah. he should be. Because I sent him a note on Twitter. And the next thing I know is I got, you know, whoever. Pick pick a name. All of a sudden, they're in this little circle of, you know, whatever. And we're talking about COVID and everything talking. Everybody everybody makes sense. And, and, you know, Joe Dolia. You know, that guy Mm. is a wealth of knowledge. And Ron, you know. Yeah. it, it, these guys, like people on here, are willing to offer up information, and they've taught me so much about things I need to know. You know, um, my wife and I, you know, and I know this may sound radical, but like I'm going to be out of town this weekend. Last night we were walking, and she says to me, well, what, what happens if you can't get out? What are you going to do? Where are you going to be? What happens if this thing goes to hell in a handbasket? I believe that anything can happen at any given time. Yep. You know, anything. And I'm, well, you used I'm to not like think that. that here, though, right? Like you used to. Nobody used to, would think that. No, you, you used, to, you used to think like, oh, well, you know what? Anything can happen in the fucking Eastern Bloc because it could. But not you know anymore. What? That's kind of that's here, isn't it's it? Here. Kind of. We don't know. Maybe. No, we don't know. We but I'm not going to. I I I don't I, I, I don't want to be uh, up on the East Coast this weekend and um, with one of my kids and find out that I can't get home. You know. Yeah, so what do we do? So we you know we make a plan for it and so. I, I t- you know, I like to use the resources that I'm given, which is all these smart guys around me and girls. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, you know, um, Heather Shelf. I got interrupted earlier, but uh, Heather, <laughs> Heather does a deal on Friday night. Did she actually call Twitter. him? She does it. She does. She does a spaces. Yeah, Mrs. Gordon. Yeah, spaces. I still haven't Heather, done that. Heather, I haven't got into the whole spaces thing. I don't know. I've, Heather, I've dropped okay, into um, a few, but it's very like. 6 30 um, eastern on friday nights heather does have heather does yeah. happy hour it's called liberty happy hour and mine would be just and, me um, talking about bourbon like i'm you guys that's way too serious no 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 no, no. you should that's join no you should join no you should try serious. it friday try it friday night 6 30 go to heather's we'll and see. listen to, listen to her people but this it's friday great. i may well if it's eastern i won't i'll miss it but if it's this friday uh i should have uh, well, christina and I, we should be doing another banter thing with christina finally by the way christina joins them and no, um, no, I believe it. Christina. Yeah, you know, she does. I, and, um, I, I believe it. She's very, she inquisitive. does. She wants to but learn. it lasts about 10 hours. And, and by the end wow. of the night, Heather is hammered. <laughs> it's <hysterical. laughs> That's me. That's me without the video. Yes. Much shorter. Right. That's yes. Funny. Yes. 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 And grandpa's yelling at the libertarian. So it's funny. So, um, well, yeah, I mean, but, um, that's, that's but, what grandpa but, does. So, so, you know, you're asking me that question, you know, and I, 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 I believe it. Like I'm going to say, Oh, that's crazy. First off, anybody who tells me they know that that's a fact, I kind of go, eh, it's probably not really what happened. Anybody says that's not possible, it's not going to happen. I'm kind of like, eh, it's actually very possible. Do I know that somebody went into a to the World Games or whatever that was? Yeah, yeah, I, exactly, right. Do I know? I don't know. Did it seep through their skin or did they inject it to their nose? I don't know. But here's what I know. I I start with. I know that people that have the ability to do something like that are willing to take left-hand turns that I'm not. Yep. So all I know is, hey, I've got to have faith in myself and my wife and my kids and my neighbors and my church and my, my friends and my coworkers and the guys around me. And, and I got to figure out, hey, if this thing goes to crap, one, what am I going to do? Yeah. What am I really going to do? Yeah. I'm not Clay. You know, I'm not. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm not yeah. there's not guys. a lot of us that are. <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 loading a remington lightweight 8, 870 all right uh, you know i've got my 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 old school you know my goya 3 is going to pick up his uh his grandfather's 220 swift which by the way he's deadly with the, 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 he's at 400 yards with a 220 swift i've never seen anything like it but you so you're sitting here so i'm sitting here going oh, am i going to defend myself i'm going to fight my way out well one i changed my life i left the inner city of houston um, yeah, I, I maybe, remember reading. Yeah, I'm going to be on a farm. I'm going yeah. to be, I'm, I, and I'm around family. I mean, within an hour of me, I got enough people that I can live and survive. Yeah. Um, and I can figure out my life, and I'm and I'm working myself through that. I don't know if everybody can transplant themselves or do whatever, but but you know, I, I think that people have to ingrain themselves in their themselves in their community. And people are like, oh well, one, if I'm a servant and I'm sitting here going, I'm taking care of the elderly or the vets down the street or the or the lady whose husband has died or you know, the single mom who's got two kids who look like she's got it together. You know what? If things go bad and I've been serving people, then I think I've probably got a pretty good knowledge base of the people around me where I might be able to look for some help myself. Yep. And I'm, so if things go bad, I've been in the community. I know what I'm doing too. I think, I think that everybody needs to go buy their county sheriff a cup of coffee. I think yeah, everybody- that's a good point. 
sit down with a county sheriff. You need to go find him and yeah. say, hey, can I buy you a coffee? And you need to go talk to him and you need to ask mm -hmm. him honestly, because that guy is going to tell you where he stands. Way more powerful than people think. They're way more powerful. They're yep. the most, I think they're the most accessible, important person in a person's life. Especially yeah. if you live in a rural area. Oh, yeah. Hard if you live in Houston, because the sheriff at Harris County ain't having coffee with me. But if I live <laughs> in um, Knoxville, or if I live in Des Moines, or if I live in Idaho. Yeah, you can, you can pull it I up. mean, in Wyoming, you call them up and you go have coffee <laughs> with them. But you better figure out what your county sheriff's about. Yeah. Um, and that's it. That's sort of what I think about how, that's why I think I'm here, is to encourage people. Okay, so I got one last question for you. And I know we've kind of mentioned it briefly and, and moved on from it. But where are you, especially in coming from your world, where do you, where do you get down on the, on the, the, the cryptocurrency and the, the, the Bitcoins, the fucking everybody getting in on the Dogecoin, the, the Ureth or whatever, the Ethereum, all these cryptocurrencies that are out there. I, I think I feel like it was you that said it's not something you can use, buy, or actually whatever, right? So where are you at on that? So this has really caused a lot of angst with people. People don't like what my opinion on this is. I'm a, and and they I'm a, sh whether they like it or not, they should, they should listen to it because you actually know what the hell you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about to some extent. So okay. when, you're talk when you're talking about currency, when you're talking yep. about transactable currency, and you're talking about the government, you're talking about the Federal Reserve, you're talking about the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency, which means you default to the, to the U.S. dollar when you're talking about um, the basis for every other currency, right? So it's the, you have the dollar value and then you have yuans or euros or, yep. or reals or whatever. Pick, pick, a, pick a country. Yep. Your value of your country's currency is based upon the actual value of the U.S. dollar versus what yours, yours are. People, there's this notion in liberty movement that the blockchain and ledger is going to usurp the power of the central banks and the federal government and the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. I understand why they think that. But Bitcoin and the iPhone. Yeah. Everybody's going to get mad at me. Well, I want to see, I want, I want, I want you to look at the adaptation of, of, of both technologies. One of them controls our everyday life. It's modernized everything. It's destroyed our kids. It has changed the way we shop and do everything. And the other one has been hanging around as an investment tool. Mm -hmm. I, I own Bitcoin. I bought Bitcoin at a hundred bucks. Oh, I, fuck. Seriously. I paid $102. First time Holy I ever bought Bitcoin. Holy fuck, dude. I saw, I, I saw I, it. I, I'm I in Dogecoin, so I don't, I don't I, know what that's I, I, I saw it at five bucks. And didn't buy it. I thought they were crazy. I thought at a dollar. I got sent the oh. white paper on. I saw his white paper on Bitcoin at a dollar. And that, I kind of understood it. Good for you, man. No, 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 no. It's not. It, it is. But but I trade. I do it for a living, right? So yeah, I, I buy know. stuff all the time. I, I there are days that I might buy and sell two hundred things. Yeah. Right? So I buy things and sell them all the time. But but that's not that's not the point. The point is this: if you're using cryptocurrency as a tool to trade. <clears throat> Fine. Find hidden things of value and do whatever. But you are also in an inflationary environment where every single asset on the face of the planet is mispriced due to too much liquidity. That is real estate. It's bonds. It is um, insurance swaps. It is euro dollar swaps. It's treasuries. Everything on the planet is mispriced because there's too much cash in the market. The largest mispriced and I put quotes around assets because so much cryptocurrency is not an asset. Yeah. It's an idea. And people love to own ideas. That's fine. If you've bought cryptocurrency and you sold it at a higher thing, or if you have a quote portfolio, people that tell me they have a crypto portfolio, well, my 23 year old, I wanted to smack the crap out of him. <laughs> he's trying to tell me about crypto. And I don't understand. I'm like, dude, whatever. You're an astrophysicist. I get it you know, math more than me, but I've been watching this thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, hold on. I understand. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> That's funny that your son I get is it. trying to I get it. argue that stuff with you. That's hilarious. Oh, he's trying. Oh, he's got a whole cache. Like he's like the agent for a bunch of NFT artists or whatever. Oh whatever. God. See, that's one thing I don't, don't understand. I've had, don't I've had Maddie's friends try to explain like, hold no. on. So an no. NFT, you're, you're going to sell me on, 
a play in the sports world that I can go on YouTube and watch as many times as I want for free. I, I don't fucking get it. I don't want to get into dude, this dude, tonight. Dude, I'm, gonna tell I don't you, I'm, a, I'm not getting into it either, but I'm going to tell you something. A friend of mine, and I know it personally because I've seen it, bought a Mahomes portrait okay. of him. And he paid 30 grand for it as an NFT. No, I... This dude I'm talking about. He told me he told me so on the phone. I was driving my truck down the road, and I was like, I go, I go, I go, I go, I go, go backwards. I go, why don't you tell me something here? You bought a picture, captured, a still picture of him that anybody could have taken a hundred times, and you paid thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, dude, you don't understand. And when someone tells me, I don't understand. understand. You don't understand, bro. That's when I go, all right. You never never understand. Like he oh, was talking about man. like 7,200. I don't know if it was him or somebody $7,200 for like some, like the fucking Jordan game six shot against Utah, whatever the fuck it like, whatever I've watched it a million times on YouTube. Like, Yo, what YouTube. does that matter? How, oh, okay. But here's my, so here's my theory. Let's forget. Let's, so let's dump that. Let's so just the get, problem, let's the problem, crypto. the problem that people are having with this is that, is that, is it a tradable asset? Right. It is a, it is a class of some of them are some of them none of them are really technically commodities and none of them are currencies yet can you trade around them and make money absolutely is it going to be some power push that changes the world absolutely not under any circumstances and here's why um my firm does about 70% of every foreign currency trade that takes place on the planet electronically every day. Jesus. Every day in every currency on the planet. All right. I'm so intimately familiar with the idea of, um, of what the mechanisms are by yeah. which you're monitoring this, right? They can, there's a push. So like today, there is going to be a push by the SEC to regulate Coinbase's issuance yeah. of different, quote, securities or loans. People then will say to me, well, you can't, I can spend money on it because I'm using a pick a coin Visa card or a pick a coin MasterCard. Let me tell you what, when, when Fed dollars take place, when the Fed coin takes place, which is going to be the digital Fed federal dollar and there's a there's an argument out there that it's actually not a u.s dollar it's going to be a new currency i kind of fall on the side of and eh, it's going to be the u.s dollar but digital they're waiting to watch and see how the free market yeah adopts transactional practices so the visa mastercard american express whoever's doing transactions right this wallet to wallet thing well there has to be a technology that actually there's to be a commercial technology that transfers these things. That's the crux. They're going to be able to monitor them. The reason that Biden's administration is getting ready to change the reporting limits to the IRS on transactions from $10,000 to $600 is because of crypto. You're going to wake up one day and you're going to have this crypto portfolio and there's going to be some sort of legislation that secretly gets put into some $3 trillion bill and you're going to wake up and every single one of you MFers that's sitting out there thinking you have, you know, done with this or done that or bought, you know, they, they, this black market idea. Well, most people I don't think are in the crypto market for black market stuff. I think they're in there for normal market. And they think they're going to be able to use their crypto portfolio. And I, I'm going to get, gosh, I don't want to do this because it's going through some stuff. If the world falls apart, if the U.S. dollar gets derailed, if the train comes off the tracks, and you're holding a crypto portfolio, the very first thing that's going to happen is going to be, and there are people that I think will be able to circumvent this idea. <clears throat> they will be able to circumvent it, but the vast majority of people will not. And what you think you have literally will not be there. This boy is calling me. It's just not going to be there. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. So, and and Miss Goya is calling. And she's calling, know what? so I'm going to hang up. Hey, yeah. hang on. Hey, Miss Goya. <laughs> How are you? Hey. You can tell I'm, her. I'm, I'm calling it a night. Yeah, we're gonna wrap it up, Miss Goya. Don't worry. We're gonna let them we're gonna let them come back to you because we're done. I do want to make one I do want to make one final statement because as, yep. as I said, my my, my my 23 year old and my 13 year old have been in the NFT market. 
The 13 year old. Wow. Well, he like, he's an artist, right? So like he yeah, likes to do good. artwork. And so what I think when you're sitting here and you're trying to tell the average person, can you trade it? Yes. Can you buy it? Can you sell it? The thing that I want to make very clear to people before we end this is that the only time anything on this planet has value, it is when somebody else is willing to buy it. Right. Right. Yeah. If you remove excess liquidity from the financial markets, all of these different things, and that includes, you know, people understand that when it comes to their house, people understand it when it comes to a used car, people understand it when yeah. it comes to different things. But when they have these notions of things that are in the digital space, because it's so glamorized and it's so, um, it's trendy. Ms. Right. Goya, she just said trendy. Um, it's Good job, trendy, Ms. Goya. Right? Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Actually, we'll have to get you actually, on actually, 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 Eric, what you said earlier, what you said earlier is true. You said uh, LeBron James basketball shoes. Yeah. Okay. Well, think about yeah. it like that. At some point, there's no value in that. If mm -hmm. the government can legislate the ability to minimize the value of those products against the US dollar, they're yep. going to do it. And it, it'll, it'll happen in a way where there are really good people and there's kids like, like, my, like my son, my 23 year old. Yep. My thing with him is, hey, if you're going to do this, do it right. Be ready to get in, be ready to get out and understand what you're investing in because you're not really investing in it. You're taking a huge flyer. It's a giant risk for people. These things can be, these companies that are putting these coins out there can literally cease to exist overnight. Yeah, that's and, what's crazy. And, and, and the it's thing scary pain, it's very scary. It, they just, they just, they're just gone. Yep. And, and there's several people who push back on this. And a lot of people push back against me on it because and especially people who think like libertarians, they think that libertarians think that Bitcoin is going to somehow, re maybe replace, not Bitcoin, but, but, but some sort of come replace the dollar, right? Replace the US dollar. Yeah. And, and my, my theory is this, and, and, and look, I reserve the right to be wrong about everything. I, I, I'm <laughs> not, I'm not a PhD. I'm a college dropout. I'm just a guy. And the people that are, that are in charge of the US dollar, they prove time and time again that they are willing, one, that they, they, they're willing to do things that, that people don't think they're willing to do because I wouldn't do it or you wouldn't do it or your listeners or your viewers, they would not do it. So they think other people won't. They are willing to do it. And if you think they're going to give up their power over the central banks, and if you think they're going to give up their power over the bond market or the Black Rocks buying houses, if you think they're going to give up their power just because somebody has a digital coin that has value to you today, because you think you want to yep. own it, you're crazy. And if that's what you're investing in, and if that's what you're betting your retirement on, you're out of your mind. So that's what I want to end on is I want people to be safe. I want people to understand what they're dealing with. I'm not saying US dollars are the best. What I'm saying is trust yourself, trust your neighbors, be kind. Um, Oh, she just hung up. She goes, she hung up on you. Oh, she, no, she goes, call me. She goes, she, goes, she, goes, she, goes, she goes, wrap it up and call me. But, but yeah, I, I, up, I, I want people to be relational and intentional. And yep. I want people to be thoughtful and logical. And I want people to understand that there are people out here that care. Um, you know, there's a big thing in the vet community. Hey, pick up, pick up the phone and call me. Pick up the exactly. phone and call. Yeah. You know, I, I appreciate that. And, 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 and I'll say it too. You know, I'm always here to listen. Um, I, I can't relate to those experiences, but what I can relate to is, is, is a guy trying to be better for his family. I yeah. can relate to it's all relatable. You can find business. it. You can find how it relates. Business. Yeah. Whatever. So that's what I'm here for. And listen, Eric, thank you. I think you do a great job. And I, and, and hey, I, man, I appreciate that, buddy. And I, I appreciate you coming on. And like I said, you can find, if you're on Twitter and you made it this far, all right, get on the Twitter, follow Javi at Javier Goya seven. You can follow me at Eric TWB. Right. And then you can get on these podcasts, these websites on YouTube and, and, and subscribe, like, share it, tell all your friends, come listen to Javier Goya break down everything that we talked about tonight. Uh, there will be bourbon. There was bourbon. There was actually tequila. And that's where we're at, brother. And you drink tequila and I'm never letting you, for, let, never letting you live it down. Right here. I, I, I drank like legit. I didn't drink. Oh, I didn't even get to tell you real quick. So let me go back before we get out of here. So Maddie fiance in there she tried to kill me last single de mayo 2020 right this was before we were living together 
She came over. She was like, yeah, I'll make margaritas for you. And I was like, oh, great. I'd love to drink margaritas on Cinco de Mayo. And so she did. She made me three of them. Within five minutes of her going home that night, I was in the bathroom violently vomiting. And at the point where I could have probably beat the fuck out of King Kong. Like, that's how violently upset and angry I was that, A, I was throwing up. Like, I'm like, who throws up after drinking three margaritas? And B, I was just like, because I'm throwing up, I'm very angry, and I just want to fight the biggest, largest creature on the planet. And that is why I try to stay away from tequila, my friend, because Maddie in there, love of my life, tried to kill me. I survived, because that's what I do. I survived. And B, I had nothing physical to fight and get all this aggression and anger out, which comes from tequila, not bourbon. And so, uh, yeah, that's the story. And I'm glad you were here to hear it. And I haven't had a margarita or a piece of, or a, a drop of tequila since so May nice. 5th, 2020. Well, guess what? It didn't yeah. kill you. So it, tequila made you stronger. <laughs> I sure the fuck hope it did, man. Cause that was, you, a won't, admit, you, won't, you won't admit it, but that's all, all right. right. I'll tell you what, I'm, you know I'm what? I'll, I'll hey, tell listen, you the story. He's calling so me again. I'm going to go. I got to go. Yeah. All right, brother. Thanks for dropping. I'm out. Brother, I, love you, I, I love you, brother. Great job and stay in there. Bye. Good Thanks, night. Buddy. All right, man.